All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Talking Christianity Apologetics. My name is Josh Gibbs, and today we are doing an eschatology debate between myself and Stacy Turbeville, who we've had on in the past. And uh, stay tuned with us because it's going to be a preterist debate versus uh, premillennialism. So uh, we will be right back after this video. Make sure today that you leave this place knowing that you are saved to the glory of God. Thanks. That one I'm going to choose. If you believe that, friends, you don't know the gospel. Is that the wonder of the cross is that no one gets injustice. If you, if you end up under the wrath of God, it is because you've rejected his provision for you and you are justly punished for your sin. To what the scriptures teach. I think the Bible does teach that God desires the salvation of all men. He has provided uh, for uh, the, the salvation of all men. And therefore, anyone who, who ends up under the wrath of God, it is because they have rejected his provision for them. And they are justly punished for their sins. The question my... that for, seeks to provide an answer to this question, for whose sins did Jesus die? The extent of the atonement asks the question, for whose sins did Jesus die? There are only two answers, two possible answers to that question. Either Jesus died for the sins of some people, or Jesus died for the sins of all people. All right, welcome back to another episode of Talking Christianity. Again, we're doing a debate today between myself and Stacy Turbeville on uh, eschatology. So Stacy holds uh, what is called a full preterist perspective on the end times, the last days, and I hold a premillennial view as well on that. So it's going to be two opposing, two opposing sides of the eschaton, and we're going to hammer these things out. Let me look at, um, I'll go into kind of what the itinerary is going to look like for the debate today, but let me get Stacy on. We'll do our introductions and go from there. Stacy, I've got you on the screen. It's uh, good to have you back, man. <laughs> yeah, Josh, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, it's it's uh, kind of been a long time coming. Our last debate, for those of you who didn't know and haven't caught that uh, that that live stream that we did a few weeks ago, that was on uh, that was um, that was on the deity of Christ, particularly his view of oneness versus my view of Trini the Trinity. So if you get a chance, go check that debate out as well. Uh, but today is going to be a debate uh, kind of on a completely different subject, but it'll be a good time. So if you guys get a chance to, please feel free to share this link and uh, to copy anybody that you think might be interested in a topic like this. Um, and other than that, I think we're going to go ahead and get rolling with it. So let me put the itinerary up so you can kind of see what that is going to look like. Actually, it's kind of delayed there um let me see here recent there it is okay so you should be able to see this now it'll be 20 minute introduction for each person uh stacy's gonna get us going first we'll transition into seven minute rebuttals each and then 10 minute cross-examination each then a second round of 10 minute cross-examinations with 15 minutes open dialogue uh, seven minute closing statements. It doesn't have to use, and obviously you don't have to use the full time on any one of these, but if you want to, you can. Then we'll open it up to you in the audience for open questions, which that number for you to call in, you'll have a chance to call in if you would like to. That is, uh, let's see here. That number is 816-866-0025. So when we get to the end of our opening statements, we'll open it up to you all. Uh, to call in with your questions and let us know uh, who you're interested in addressing that question to and go from there. So other than that, we've got next week uh, is going to be Kevin Thompson is coming on to the podcast to talk about Calvinism. So that should be a good conversation. I think that we're going to do a little bit of a video review as well um, on a debate that a lot of you guys have probably already seen uh, between – it, it was um, – Reformed, reformed apologist. I can't remember his, his his full name, but it was on the modern day debate between him and Skylar Fiction a few weeks back. So we're 
we're probably going to be looking at that and some other aspects of Calvinism re regarding the gospel and the implications uh, of Calvinism on the gospel. So stay tuned for that next week. Um, and other than that, guys, that's all I've got. So Stacy, you are up for your 20 minute introduction whenever you're ready. Um, I will put that timer up on the board. We'll be we'll be good to go from there. And I'll get the camera on to you. It didn't actually pop up there, so let me open that up. Cool. All right, man. Have at it whenever you're ready. All right. I'm going to try to get this all in in 20 minutes. If not, then we'll try to get it in during our questions and cross-examinations. Um, when I look at uh, for my studies, um, the reason I'm full preterist is because everything seems to point to a first generation fulfillment in Jesus's day for the purpose of cleansing God's covenant and ushering in that new covenant that's going to last forever here on earth. And that's what I'm going to try to show you today is that the new covenant is not something that's short term and then finishes and goes into heaven in some um, utopian planet but instead is going to be a continuation on this planet as God blesses each generation um, from now on with the, with the gospel as, as getting saved and coming into the kingdom. So I'm going to start at Genesis. I'm, I'm just going to run it through the whole scripture. I think that's probably the best way. Just go through the Old Testament, show you the foundation, and then come to the New Testament and just show you the fulfillment. Um, I'm going to start at Genesis 2.17, and I think this is where it begins, and this is the foundation. God is a spirit, and we should worship him in spirit. And I think that is the key in God's, the whole plan of God is about his spiritual kingdom. And the ultimate goal is for us to have a spiritual resurrection in heaven with him. That's going to be the climax, and that's our goal. And if you go, I'm going to start at Genesis 2.17 at Adam and Eve's sin. Because I think this is the foundation of scripture. It says, Jesus was talking to Adam. He said, from the, from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Now notice, he says, the day that you eat. Adam, after this, lives about 900 more years in the physical. But the day that he ate, it, he was changed. His spirit died within him. And that's what God is looking at, is that spiritual death. So he's standing there. Of course, Satan is the one that drew them to sin. And if you go to chapter 3, um, Satan is standing there with Adam and Eve. And he says, he's talking about Eve. He says, of her seed... Um, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. And that is the first mention of prophecy of Jesus Christ. He's going to be that seed from Eve that's going to crush Satan. But notice that seed. What seed did Satan plant? He planted death. He, he, he destroyed the spirit. The seed that Christ is going to usher in is the new spiritual birth. He's going to awaken our spirit. He's going to give us a spirit of God within us. And that's what the seed contradictions are here. And that's going to follow all through scripture. So what I'm going to do now is just point out some things that we need to understand when we get to the New Testament. And uh, the way you interpret scripture is through the Hebraic mindset. You have to read it and understand that they use terms in certain ways and you have to keep that formula understand what they're talking about you can't look at it through the greeks or romans or even now in 21st century america you just can't read scripture and say oh that's that's what we're saying that's that's how we interpret it you have to interpret it the way they're using it and so one thing I want to point out is the way Scripture uses the constellations, the stars, the moon, the earth, heavens, the sun. If you go to, um, if you remember, and I'm going to start at this foundation, when you go to Joseph, when he's taught, when he has that vision, 
he he tells his mom and dad about the vision of how the sun, moon, and stars is going to bow down to him. And they were like, are we the sun, moon, and stars? What he's talking about is the kingdom of Israel. Jacob and his sons are the kingdom of Israel. And Israel, in Scripture, is used a lot of times as these constellations. That's why a lot of times, if you don't understand that, some verses just don't make any sense when it uses the sun, moon, and stars in heaven and earth. But this is the foundation. This is the foundational verse on, the, on these things. And a big thing about the constellations is they're used in judgment language. If you go to Isaiah 13.10, um, it talks about the stars, the sun, and moon will be dark. The heavens will tremble. The earth will move from its place. This is talking about the battle between the Medes defeating the Babylonian Empire. It's simply judgment language that the Hebrews used to tell you how important kingdom changes are. Isaiah 19 does the same thing. It says the Lord will ride on a cloud. He will melt the Egyptians' hearts. That's a huge statement. He will melt. The term melt in scripture when it talks about judgment is not literal it's just talking about the power the importance of these changes and here god is talking about defeating the egyptians when you go to joel it does the same thing now joel is prophesying the destruction of jerusalem in the future and in chapter three it says the moon stars they'll go dark the heavens and earth will tremble so same thing we're talking about a battle, a war, a judgment using um, constellations just to give you how important it meant to them. So now I'm going to skip over to the New Testament just to go over some of these verses about the sun, moon, and the stars and earth. It says um, in Matthew 24, um, 29 and 30, it talks about the Son of Man is going to come on the clouds. Well, come on the clouds, remember, in Isaiah 19, that's God coming on the clouds. It's judgment. Um, and that's what Jesus is saying here. He's just using terms in Isaiah. Jesus quoted Isaiah a lot, describing what was going on in his day, showing you the, the prophecies from the Old Testament, how they use these words. Um, Second Peter talks about the earth and its works will be burned up. It'll melt with fervent heat. This is the same thing. Peter's not talking about planet Earth. He's talking about the old covenant is going to be destroyed and the new covenant is going to come in. How are they destroyed? The Roman Empire destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed Israel. And that's what he's that's what Peter's talking about. Um, so now what I'm going to do is contrast judgment language with when the Bible talks about heaven and earth, sun and moon, as far as just the planets. Just to show you a difference. And, and let's look at what Scripture really says about literal heaven, earth, sun and moon. If you go to um, Psalms 104.5, it says the earth will sit on its axis forever and ever. That's some serious detail. So think about back when we were talking about judgment. He talked about the earth will tremble. If it sits on its axis forever, that would be a contradiction. Um, so as you can see, when it talks about the earth, it, it's stable. If you go to Ecclesiastes 1.4, it says, Generations come, generations go, but earth is established forever. Here's talking about planet earth. The planet earth is, once again, is here forever. Now I'm going to show you... Um, something in Jeremiah 33, and this is a huge verse because this introduces the new covenant and it gives us some details about the new covenant. If you go to um, Jeremiah 33, 20, it says, if you can break my covenant for the day and my covenant for the night, so that day and night will not be at their appointed time, then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant so that he will not have a son to reign on his throne with the Levitical priests, my ministers. 
As the host of heaven cannot be counted and the sand of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the descendants of David my servant. This is talking about the prophecy of Jesus fulfilling David's throne and talking about the new covenant. But notice that it says the new covenant lasts as long as the sun and moon. So as long as the sun and moon is going to be in our sky, that's how long the new covenant is going to be. And of course, I showed you already, it's forever. Um, if you skip down, it makes another reference to this in 25 and 26. It says, thus says the Lord, in my covenant for day and night, stand not and the fixed patterns of heaven and earth I have not established. Um, wait a minute, I skipped before. Yeah. Then I would reject the descendants of Jacob and David, my servant, not taking from his descendants rulers over the descendants of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So here it's saying not only the sun and moon, but it's saying heaven and earth. It's fixed patterns are going to be established forever as long as the new covenant is here. I think that's huge when it comes to the fact that um, dispensationalists. And all futurist teachers think that the literal earth and heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. They'll be destroyed. Scripture, I think, teaches clearly that God's creation is here forever. It's talking about judgment language when it talks about, you know, the earth melting with fervent heat in Second Peter. Um, so now I'm going to skip down to... Um, so we went over to heaven and earth. Let's go. To, let's talk about the um, new covenant for a minute. You know, dispensations talk about new covenant. It's going to continue on in this new planet. The problem with that is the new covenant promises that they will have offspring forever and ever. If you go to Isaiah 59, 21 and Isaiah 66, 22, it talks about the offspring I already showed you the part about generations and generations, but Ephesians 3.21 says the same thing. It talks about the new covenant will last forever to all generations. So to have offspring means you're going to have to have children. You're going to have to be passing it down to generations um, in the future. Um, whereas all futures teaches you'll go to heaven on this new planet and it's all over. You'll be like the angels. You know, there's no male or female. There's no having babies in a utopian planet. Um, and I see in scripture clearly teaches there's offspring in the new kingdom. And um, let's look at the new heaven and new earth. Um, you know, they talk about it being a new planet. Let's look at some details. If you read Isaiah 65 and 66, it says, They'll have death. They'll live to be about 100 years old. Um, they'll be cursing. Those, that's verse 20. Verse 21, they'll build and plant. This is 65. Uh, 65, 22, they'll live as long as trees. 66, 22, um, they'll have offspring. If you look at verse 63, time is still here. Um, the new covenant will be from moon to moon, from Sabbath to Sabbath in this, in this new heaven and new earth. So there you see time is still here. The weeks are still here. If you go to Revelations 22, which is supposedly after the new planet's already here and the lost is gone, it says outside the city are the lost. Um, that's a huge statement. The outside the city, the new Jerusalem, is the sinners and the lost. It's talking about um, getting saved and joining the new covenant, the new Jerusalem. Um and like I said, the new heaven, new earth, it's just a new covenant. It's talking about the time that we're living now. People are getting saved. They're being added to the kingdom. In fact, um, if you remember Isaiah 9, 7, it says of his government, it will always increase. That means people will be born and keep getting saved um, to keep adding to the number in the kingdom. Um, that's the only way you can increase the kingdom is to have more people get saved. Um, so I just think that um, it's, Scripture clearly shows that that's um, the mindset. It's, 
when it's talking about new heavens, new earth, it's just talking about the new covenant age. Um, so now I think the big thing is time indicators. Um, and this is um, just one thing that just I had to go full preterist because I was partial preterist for years. Um, because I could understand. I saw Matthew 24. I saw Luke 21. I understood there's no way I could change that it was in Jesus' day, those fulfillments. But the problem was, the more I kept studying the time indicators, there's over 80 time indicators. Every single one is a first-generation fulfillment. And when I read Daniel 12, I ignored it. I knew Daniel 12 was going to be the the kicker, but not counting Isaiah 65 and 66. But Daniel 12, 1 through 7, is just devastating to any futurist. Um, the components of Daniel 12, it says, Now at the time that Michael the great prince stands up over his sons of the people, there will be a time of distress such as never before that there was a nation until that time and of the, your people. He's talking to Daniel. He's talking about the Jews. Everyone who's found written in the books will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, those to everlasting life, others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine bright like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. This is clearly talking about Jesus' return, his resurrection of the dead, and the sending out of the gospel, verse 1 through 3. Now, when you read down, it tells you when this happens. He said, I heard the man distressed in linen who was above the waters of the rivers, and he raised his right hand and his left toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever um, that it will be times, times, and half times. And as soon as they finish shattering the power of the holy people, all these events will be completed. Uh, all what events? One through three. The shattering of the holy people was when they lost their temple, when the temple was destroyed, because the power of the, old, the holy people, of course, is old covenant in Israel. When they lost their temple is when they lost their connection with God. Their power was God. God was in the temple. He was always with them, protecting them. He lost, they lost their power when they lost their temple. And that's when this resurrection occurred. The resurrection of the dead is the resurrection of Old Testament's um, People who've lived in the Old Testament. That's why when you go to 20, it says that all the books were open. It's talking about the law. It's talking about your works. And the book of life is open. The book of who was saved. And if you notice, he goes and tells Daniel, if you keep reading Daniel 12, that he, you know, he's going it, to, it's not time for this to occur. Um, if you go to, he says, um, Verse 9, he said, go your way, Daniel, for these words are concealed until the time of the end. And he tells him that he will lay with his fathers. But then if you go to verse 13, he says, but as for you, well, here it is. But, but as for you, go your way to the end. Then you will enter into rest and rise again for your allotted portion at the end of the age. He's talking about the end of the old covenant age is when Daniel's resurrection will occur. In this same resurrection talked about in verse 1 through 3, when Christ returns, he resurrects the dead, brings them to heaven. The reason he has to do that is you can't get to heaven while there's the earthly temple. Um, you'll see that in a huge important verse, is Hebrews 9, 8. It says the temple, um, the Holy of Holies is not open um, as long as there's an earthly temple. And so Hebrews, of course, is written before the temple was destroyed. But the temple, once it got destroyed in the last day of the old covenant, God resurrects, you know, the dead, takes them to heaven who saved. From then on, anybody who's saved under the new covenant immediately goes to heaven. That's why Jesus said, you know, John 11, you know, believe in me, you'll never die. Well, once we get rid of the old covenant temple, heaven was opened to all of us. And that's what he's talking about in Hebrews 9:8. Same thing here. This, the whole point is heaven is now open, so Daniel, the resurrection can happen, and um, the whole Abraham bosom, all that's gone. It's all, heaven is now open, and we reign with him once we die, as we die in the new covenant. We, go, we immediately receive our spiritual body. 
If you go to um, 1 Corinthians 15, I think it's 52, he says, um, the ones that are sleeping will be raised incorruptible, but we who are alive will be changed. That's what happens at this resurrection. The ones who died, they become incorruptible. They're raised, they're in heaven with Christ. The ones that are alive receive the, fulfill, the fullness of the Holy Spirit um, when the Holy Spirit comes down at the end of the Old Covenant in fullness. The Holy Spirit, in those 40 years from the new, once Peter preaches um, at Pentecost, those 40 years, it's a special, um, it's a sign of salvation when the apostles lay their hands on you and you receive the Spirit. If you remember, people were getting, they were believing in Christ, getting baptized, but they didn't have the Holy Spirit. They had to have the, the apostles lay on them. It was a sign. It was a sealed until the day of redemption. The day of redemption is when um, the old covenant ended and they were resurrection. They were resurrected. You're not, um, you know, you're not, saved until you're resurrected completely until then it's just a promise let's go to some more time indicators um let's see. that's actually you've you're at 21 minutes now oh i'm sorry all right we'll talk about the rest of it in, in our other time cool sounds good so, awesome okay i'm going to cut this back to me and get that clock so it's not in a bad place all right that looks all right right there Cool. All right. Hey, um, Stacy. thanks again for being willing to uh, do this debate. I think that um, it's interesting to see a debate between a full preterist and a uh, premillennial position because uh, you don't see either one of those a whole lot anymore today. But I think that um, anybody would uh, really admit that the preterist view is e even more peculiar than the premillennial view. Today, and even though you know throughout church history, people would have uh, t predominantly held to uh, a premillennial uh, perspective on on the second coming of Christ as being physical and literal and visible. But today's debate is obviously going to be about full preterism versus premillennialism. And I would encourage you again, if you're if you're watching this, to go back and watch the last debate that Stacy and I did, um, and his perspective on oneness theology versus Trinitarian theology. Uh, that debate is is a really good debate to kind of lay the groundwork for kind of where we're going with the perspectives of our end times uh, theology. Um, he he he's obviously got some big differences on who we believe is the person of Jesus Christ as it's related to his deity um, and those kinds of things as well. But by way of introduction, in the words of Thomas Ice, he says preterists teach that the Book of Revelation is primarily a prophecy about the Roman War against the Jews in Israel that began in A.D. 67 and ended with the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70. In order for the Revelation to be a prediction of the future, which in the book of Revelation alone, it's seven different references uh, showing that it, it would have all been fulfilled by August of A.D. 70, then it had to have been written by A.D. 65 or A.D. 66 for the preterist interpretation to even be a possibility. Now, the preterist Ken Gentry has noted this major weakness, for he said, a fellow early date advocate, David Chilton, quote, if it could be demonstrated that Revelation were written 25 years after the fall of Jerusalem, Chilton's entire labor would go up in smoke, unquote. Actually, all one would have to do is to simply show that Revelation was written any time after the destruction of Jerusalem. And the futurist interpretation is not dependent upon the date of Revelation, since it doesn't matter when these events take place, since they are still future to our own time. However, the date of Revelation is essential to the preterist position and explains why they are so focused upon de defending an early date. There are two lines of evidence, external, which would be evidence from the outside, from outside the Revelation, and then internal, evidence from inside the Revelation. So I'm gonna I'll look at the internal evidence first, which I, uh, before I do, I hold to the futurist view, which says that some of the prophecies of the destruction of Jerusalem were fulfilled, but that they are not the events of the great tribulation as we understand them. These are not the end times prophecies Jesus is speaking about when it comes to the fullness of the end of, of times prophecies. And that's where you'll see differences between our interpretive methods for Luke 21 and Matthew 24 um, and, and how those two 
uh, lineup because Luke 21 is going to show some some of the end times uh, side of AD 70 with the destruction of Jerusalem, where Matthew 24 is going to be a reference to the tribulation period. And maybe we'll be able to dive into that and break it down as we go. But in, in, in Ken Blanchard's practical book on leadership, he says this about goals and visions as it relates in a practical sense to everyday life. He says, in every picture of the future, it's important to distinguish between goals and visions. A goal is a specific event that once achieved becomes a piece of history and as such is superseded by a new goal. In contrast, a vision is an ongoing, evolving, hope-filled look into the future that excites people, even though they know they'll never see its complete fulfillment. In the case of eschatology, the full preterist has a poor goal that's never attainable and no vision which leaves them no hope for the future that they will ever see. And in Stacy's perspective, he, den he denies a literal, visible, phys physical resurrection, and places Jesus' return in 70 AD. In a recent Facebook dialogue, this is what Stacy responded to another Facebook user on the subject. Brendan, quote, Here's the thing people missed. Read, read 1 Kings 8. First off, God's throne is David's throne, which means the one reigning on it will do so in heaven. Jesus was the Father come to be the Savior. A God cannot die. He was the Spirit in the man Jesus. This is why God resurrected him. Once Jesus ascended, he gave the kingdom to the Father because the Father was the God and the anointed man, Jesus Christ. This is explained in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 24 through 28. When Jesus returned in AD 70 to resurrect the dead who died during the Old Covenant, he did it spiritually in the glory of the Father, Titus 2.13. It's the same coming on the clouds as in Isaiah 13.19 when Jesus uh, in, slash God returns on a cloud. It's always in judgment. This time it's Old Covenant Israel and its city and temple being destroyed. This is considered the last day of the Old Covenant Jesus and the apostles talked about. Luke 21, Matthew 10, 16, 24, 1 John 2, 1 Peter 4, and Revelation 1. This is also when God gives us the fullness of the Spirit, Revelation 21. And God is in Jesus, reigning with us who died spiritually, resurrected after the temple was destroyed. Hey, Stacy, um, I don't know if you could mute your mic, but I can hear your dog barking. <laughs> um, but anyways, so let's recap. Stacy does not believe that Jesus is the second person of the Trinity. Jesus is a man with a divine nature as a, a part of the incarnation. He believes the deity aspect of Jesus is the Father and the Son. He believes Jesus returned in 70 AD to resurrect the Old Testament saints, and it wasn't a physical return or physical resurrection. He believes the Old old Covenant ended in AD 70, and we are spiritually reigning right now because the new heavens and new earth are not literal but spiritual. Of course, all this is debunked if one can simply prove that the book of Revelation was written toward the latter end of the first century. In which case, I will prove both the external and the internal witnesses that the book of Revelation was written after 70 AD, somewhere around 95 AD. And I'll show the internal witnesses, which show a future literal resurrection and reign of Jesus Christ on earth, with many future events that simply did not happen in 70 AD. So let's start with the internal. This is also by Thomas Ice. He says, many preterists contend that there are two major reasons from the book of Revelation itself that provide proof for their early date. First, they argue that since John refers to a temple in Jerusalem in Revelation 11, that it must have been standing at the time of the writing. If, if still standing, then Revelation was written before the temple's destruction in AD 70. Next, they would contend the seven kings in Revelation 17 refer to a succession of Roman kings in the first century. Preterists contend that one is, quote-unquote, Revelation 17 would be a reference to Nero, Caesar, and the other is not come, would be uh, Galba. Thus, when John writes Nero was still alive and Galba was looming in the near future, this would mean, according to Preterists, that Revelation was written while Nero was still alive. Now, in rebuttal of the full Preterist argument, it must be remembered that the book of Revelation, John is receiving a vision about future things. He is transported in some way to the future time in order to view events as they will unfold. The word saw is used 49 times in 46 verses in Revelation because John is witnessing future events through a vision. It doesn't matter at all whether the temple is thought to be standing in Jerusalem at that time. John sees the vision since that would not have any bearing upon a vision. John's told by an angel to measure the temple in Revelation 11. Well, measure what temple? He's to measure the temple in the vision. Even if there was a temple still standing in Jerusalem, John was on the island of Patmos and would not have been allowed to go and measure the temple. Ezekiel, during a similar vision of a temple, had a similar vision of a temple in, in chapters 40 through 43, 
of Ezekiel was told to measure that temple. When Ezekiel saw and was told to measure a temple, there was not one standing in Jerusalem, and Preterists would agree with this. Thus, there's no compulsion whatsoever to conclude that just because a temple is referenced in Revelation 11, that it implies there had to be a physical temple standing in Jerusalem at the same time the vision was seen. The other Preterist argument is polluted by the same assumption that underlies their previous contention about the temple. Preterists assume that the line of kings refer to a, a first century succession of Roman kings and then pronounce Nero as the one to which Revelation 17.10 refers. This is an assumption that begs the question, John is to a single source such since Hegesippus in AD 150 testimony predates Irenaeus. And, quote, unquote, the first clear accepted unambiguous witness to the Neuronic date is a, is a one-line subscription in the Syriac translation of the New Testament in AD 550, unquote. And uh, this it comes from notes from Mark uh, Hitchcock, seeing, recording, and commenting on a vision in the future. But I'll, I'll look at that as we get into the external evidence um, with the quotes from Hegespus and Irenaeus and Tertullian and some of these other guys as well for the late date and why that's why that's obviously not the case that it was written before the destruction of Jerusalem. So anyways, this cannot be used as a proof that he was viewing a particular time frame without having previously in some way established the time period in which he views the vision. So Preterists have not previously established when such a, a time frame is to take place. This line of reasoning by Preterists is not an internal proof for an Aronian date for Revelation. The alleged proofs for an early date precept of Preterist interpretation, this certainly has not been established as a false stating point, starting point in which they attempt to argue from. Now, regardless of the interpretation of this passage, it cannot be used as a proof for when Revelation was written. Uh, these, this passage is, is providing a landscape of biblical history of those kingdoms, not individual kings which have persecuted Israel. The five that are fallen refer to the kingdoms of Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Medo-Persia, and Greece. The sixth empire was reigning at the time when John, uh, when John, wrote, when John wrote was Rome. I, I'm not sure I got that sentence right. The seventh that is to come will be the future kingdom of the Antichrist, known in Revelation as the beast. This view is consistent with the way in which kings, i.e. kingdoms, are used throughout both Daniel and Revelation. Revelation 17.10 says that the future leader in his empire will have a short life according to the words, quote, when he comes, he must reign, remain a little while, unquote. The adjective little has the idea of brevity, Revelation 12.12. 12. God is saying that he has decreed the time of this final empire will be shorter than the six previous. This factor alone would eliminate the possibility of the seven kings being first century Roman emperors. Now, in dealing with the seven churches, this is huge in, in, in uh, debunking the, the full preterist position for a lot of reasons. But one in particular, one of the key internal uh, evidences, which does not require positive in particular interpretive approach, is the condition of the seven uh, churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Now, do these churches look more like first generation churches? which would appear to support an early date, or do they favor a second generation church, which would support the later date? There's some key evidences that strongly favor a second generation date, which was in Ephesus at the time, would overlap with John's writings of Revelation and his letter to the church at Ephesus in Revelation 2, 1 through 7. It would also mean that Paul likely wrote 2 Timothy after John wrote to the church. The problem is that the error um, that the error that Christ points out to the Ephesians in Revelation would have surfaced in Paul's epistles if they were written around the same time. However, these problems are not evident in Paul's writings. Further, it's unlikely that John had moved to Ephesus until after Peter and Paul had, had passed uh, from the scene. Philip Schaft, Schaft tells us, quote, it was probably the martyrdom of Peter and Paul that induced John to take charge of the orphan churches exposed to serious danger and trials, unquote. Polycarp, the bishop of Smyrna, said that no church existed during the ministry of Paul. Paul died around AD 66 to 67. Thus, there was not even a church in existence at Smyrna when the early daters said John wrote to them. Needless to say, that strongly favors the late date. The church at Laodicea wouldn't have had time to develop into the church described in Revelation 3, verses 14 through 22, if the early date is a true one. 
An earthquake devastated the city in 60, and history tells us it took him 25 years to rebuild it. Yet we're to believe the preterist view that says that uh, it was written prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Only the late date, which makes sense of Christ's statement to the church that says, quote, I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing in 317. Ten years would depict it would be the depiction of those churches. If John wrote early in AD 64 to 66, then it's likely that Paul's two letters to Timothy have been enough time for such a condition to develop. But it couldn't have been said of them uh, which were in the early stages of rebuilding. Now, John is said to be on the island of Patmos, which writing in Revelation because he was banished there. Yet Nero put, pe- put to death Peter and Paul. And if Revelation were written during the reign of Nero, then why wouldn't John have been killed like Peter and Paul? Banishment was Domitian's favorite way to persecute Christians. Moreover, we have no evidence of Nero's use of banishment for Christians. So the conclusion is this on the internal evidence. Since a preterist interpretation of Revelation requires an early date of the final book of Revelation, preterists go to great lengths in their attempts to make their view appear viable. The, the Domitian date is the overwhelmingly accepted view of scholarship in our day and throughout most of church history. Nothing in Revelation itself contradicts such a conclusion. It appears the major reason that preterists believe in an early date for Revelation is that if their system ha- it requires it. In this instance, the saying is true that necessity is the mother of invention. Maranatha. All right, so now let's look at the external witnesses. You've got the Neroshian dating versus the Domitian dating. And March Hitch- Hitchcock wrote his entire doctor- uh, doctoral thesis on the subject of the dating of the book of Revelation, which is free online at pre-mill.org. He debated Hank Hanegraaff years ago on the subject, and he utterly obliterated his argument for the Neroshian dating. It was it was abs- it was embarrassing to watch. Hank did a good a, as good a job as any full preterist could do in defense of that dating, but he failed miserably. And uh, keep in mind this this teaching didn't exist in Protestantism until the 1960s. Of course, we know that Louis de Alcazar uh, from 1554 to 1613 of Seville, Spain, devised what became known as the preterist system of prophetic interpretation. But it didn't become popular until many liberals and heretical sects began to adopt this view. That seriously speaks volumes to the historic existence of Revelation, having been a true book of prophecy of future events which had not happened in AD 70. All right, so let's look at the Achilles heel of full preterism, beginning of the dating of the book of Revelation. And I need to switch my... Okay, so let's look at this. Uh, Preterist R.C. Sproul writes this. If the book was written after AD 70, then its contents manifestly did not refer to the events surrounding the fall of Jerusalem. Unless the book is a wholesale fraud, having been composed after the predicted events already occurred, the burden of, for preterists then is to demonstrate that Revelation was written before AD 70. And keep in mind, Stacy built an argument completely on an internal argument as opposed to the dating of the book of Revelation which I believe has completely undercut any argument that he possibly has of recovering in this debate for uh, proving an early dating for the writing of the book of Revelation. So already he's, he's kind of set himself behind the eight ball here. But let's look at this a little bit. You've got um, Hegesippus is, is the earliest uh, author having, having been dated prior to Irenaeus, the late, um, the late first century, but but uh, the early 2nd century, sometime around um, 100 AD to 120 AD, somewhere in there is where his, where his quotations are um, quoted by Eusebius and credited as coming from Hegesippus, which Philip Schaff also agrees with that, um, as probably coming from Hegesippus, where uh, Eusebius got that quotation, which we'll look at as we go. But typically you see the first, the first external evidence being from Irenaeus in 120 to 200. And he's importing for the dating dating for two reasons. He was in Smyrna during his youth where Revelation circulated, and two, he was the disciple of Polycarp, who was the disciple of John. And keep in mind, Smyrna did not come into existence until after the destruction of Jerusalem. And that's important for a lot of reasons. But here's what Irenaeus says. But if it had been necessary to announce his name plainly uh, at at the present time, it would have been spoken by him who saw the apocalypse, for it was not long seen long ago, but almost in our time at the end of the reign of Domitian. 
This entire chapter, f- chapter 5, of Against Heresies is about the number of the beast, Revelation 13. So the context clearly speaks of the book of Revelation. And since Domitian was ass- assassinated on September 10th in 96 AD, uh, this would date the book of Revelation around AD 95. However, two objections have been raised against Irenaeus' straightforward assertion. One, it's ambiguous. So some predators would argue that the statement isn't clear. However, a number of counter-arguments would be raised. First, all four English translations of Eusebius render Irenaeus' expression clearly and without ambiguity. Moreover, none of these translations ever contain a footnote or alternate reading, alternate reading for Irenaeus' straightforward statement. Second, the nearest antecedent to Irenaeus' statement, um, it was not seen long ago, is the Apocalypse, not John. Third, the Latin translation of Irenaeus also supports the traditional interpretation. Fourth, none of the early Christian church fathers believed that Irenaeus' statement was ambiguous. They all interpreted it to mean that John saw and wrote about his vision during the reign of Domitian. And, uh, and where was I? If Irenaeus is really so ambiguous, why didn't the early church fathers think so? The first person to suggest a reinterpretation of Irenaeus was Johann Jakob Wettstein in 1752, and not surprisingly, he was a preterist. Thus, no one before him for 1,600 years ever felt his testimony was ambiguous. But I'll sum it up with this, guys. The external side goes all the way from Hegespus to Irenaeus to Tertullian to Dia de Cassius to Victorinus to Eusebius, and then you've got a, a ton of external evidence that go along with that. But for the time being, I think that's a good start for our conversation. And I'm cut this back to Stacy, and we've got um, what do we got? We've got seven minute rebuttals, which will be his first seven minutes there. And let me get the clock up to seven minutes, and he'll have the first chance to rebut my argument, and then I'll rebut his. So whenever you're ready. Can you hear me? I can now. Yeah. Yeah. I got All you right. now. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So pay attention because Josh just talked about everything outside the Bible. <laughs> Let's talk about what Revelation says. Um, look at Revelations 1. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his bond service, the things which must soon take place. Um, the reason it says that is because Revelation is John's version of Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21. It must take place because it has to take place because the temple is about to be destroyed. Um, yes, Revelation 11, 2 says, measure the temple. Of course the temple is still standing because this would be, you're going to tell me that they never mentioned the temple being gone in the book of Revelations, the most important thing to a Jew. And here it mentions the temple, measure the temple. Of course the temple is still standing. And I'm going to show you how we know that. Well, therein it says, you know, these things must soon take place. But if you go to, um, Josh mentioned Revelation 17.10, it says the sixth king is. Well, the sixth king was Nero. The seventh, it said, would rule a short time. Well, the seventh ruled about three to six months. The scripture is so accurate in how it taught. Um, so Nero's reigning, he died in like 68. So, of course, it had to be written before 68. And talking about the kingdoms, the new covenant began during the fourth kingdom. If you go back to Daniel, the fourth kingdom is clearly the Roman Empire. And Revelations is about Rome and Jerusalem, um, which is referred to as Babylon. Everything in uh, is talking about the destruction of the old covenant that rejected Christ. That's what the entire book of Revelations is about. Let me show you some more time indicators. If you go to Revelations 1-9, John is going through the tribulation with them. So he's going through that tribulation. Verse 7 says, um, those that pierced him will see Christ coming on the clouds. So those that pierced him has got to still be alive, people in that generation. Coming on the clouds, I've already shown, is a reference to judgment. If you go to 19, it says, uh, Revelation 1, 19, 
these are the things written which you have seen, things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. Revelations is about things in John's day. Um, 19 is clearly showing that. If you Revelation 14, 4, talking about the uh, 144,000, they're referred to as the first fruits. First fruits is the first believers in the New Covenant. Um, the 144 first fruits does not fit an end time situation. If you go to Romans 16, first fruits in the city was the first fruits of that meant the people that were saved in that city. So first fruits uh, scripturally is the first believers, and that's what it's talking about in Revelations. If you go to um, now, let's go to 22 because I think this is huge. Revelations 22. Jesus, um, remember Daniel, it says, close um, the book, the time is not now. Well, in Revelation 22, Jesus says, open the book, the time is now. This is in John's day. But notice what he says. Let the one who does wrong still do wrong. Let the one who is filthy stay filthy. Let the one who is righteous stay righteous. He's telling them the judgment is so close at the door you don't have time to get saved anymore. This is a this is written two thousand years ago, an angel to John about the destruction that is so immediate to their time, and that's what this is talking about. This verse cannot be two thousand later because it says, "Let them stay, let them stay sinners." Um, we've been getting saved for two thousand years. Otherwise, if this verse is accurate, been, nobody's been saved according to this verse. Um, it clearly says, this is Jesus. Nobody, let them, let them, the one do wrong, stay wrong. So there's no salvation according to this verse. But it's talking about Israel, Old Covenant Israel. It's not talking about 2,000 years later. This verse completely cannot fit in a futuristic teaching. Um, if you go to, um, let's look at 14... Oh, I already, told, I already showed this about outside the city. You have the sinners. Well, if you already got a new heaven and new earth and a new Jerusalem, which is the city, you can't have sinners in a utopian world where sin's being destroyed. This is clearly fits the preterist mindset. Um, now, I, I want to go back to one more thing if I got time. Jesus' resurrection and return. His return, I mean. Here's what Jesus said about his return. Let's look at all the verses. Matthew 10, 23. He told the disciples, they will not have witness to all the cities of Israel before he returns. Clearly, that's first century. They're still alive. They're witnessing. Matthew 16, 27 to 28, Jesus said, some of you standing here will still be alive when I return with my angels. He's talking about when the angels return with him to resurrect the old covenant dead. Clearly, that cannot be 2,000 years later. All the apostles have been gone and dead. All the disciples are gone. It's been 2,000 years. There's no way to twist the scripture. Six days later and something, no, it worked. There's no angels in that vision. Matthew 24, um, Jesus said, um, the, the apostles see the abomination of desolation spoken of in Daniel. Immediately after those things that they're going to go through, it clearly says they will go through all these trials from 15 to 32 or 15 to 28. Clearly in Matthew um, 29, he says his return is immediately after those things. So you can't put 2,000 years between immediately and the apostles going through the tribulation. You got 30 seconds. All right. Then you got um, verse 34. Jesus said it'll happen during this generation. This generation is clear in Scripture um, of that particular generation. Um, Matthew 23, Jesus clearly says... All the blood of all the prophets will be on this generation, the one that rejected the Messiah. Um, that's Matthew 23. Um, Luke 21, damaging verse 20 through 22, especially 22. Uh, when you see the army surround Jerusalem, know that this is the end of all pro All prophecy will be fulfilled. All prophecy was fulfilled at that time during um, the destruction of Jerusalem, ending the Old Covenant, the ushering them in the New Covenant. And I'll go over to other time indicators a little bit later. That'll work. Um, go ahead. 
Sounds good, okay. Thank you for that. I'm gonna cut to my camera and get that clock started. So one thing that I noticed in Stacy's rebuttal is he didn't actually refute anything that I brought up in my opening statement, which was a little bit disappointing. It was just new material that was brought in. And it is, it's good material that needs addressed, but um, for for the sake of the argument, I think it's 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 it makes it more difficult on my side to address new material that's brought in in a, in a rebuttal post to a response to what I brought up in my opening statement. So for rebuttal time, I'll try to address some of the things that he brought up um, in his opening statement. And keep in mind the the absolute Achilles' heel for the full predator's position is the dating of the Book of Revelation which again, Stacy has not addressed the dating of the book of Revelation, either in his rebuttal or uh, in his opening statement. And if I prove that the dating of the book of Revelation is late in the first century, it absolutely annihilates the full preterist position altogether. So let's look at the first argument that he brought up in his opening statement, which is the new covenant. Stacy says that the, the new covenant is, uh, is what was established and began in AD 70. He's got an internal argument for the predator's position, and in doing so, I believe he's obviously greatly undercut his position, which we've already talked about. But he says that the new covenant began um, at, at AD, AD 70 and not at the cross. What, what we're talking about is a covenant of blessing. We're talking about the new covenant, a covenant of blessing. But what's really troubling for this position for the preterist is, is the idea that a, 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 the new covenant would have began at the destruction of Jerusalem, where they would take the position that the old covenant was actually destroyed when the temple was destroyed in AD 70 in Jerusalem. So this is actually not, a, it, it would be a covenant of, of blessing in the new covenant, but it's founded on destruction. So just think about that for a minute. You're literally celebrating within a full preterist pers perspective, blessing of a new covenant through the destruction of, of one, the nation of Israel, and two, um, and two, the the old covenant itself, and and the blessings that came along with that. So I think there's a lot to be entailed in that position. And somebody in the chat had asked earlier if I would come at this position from a classic uh, dispensationalist position um, or a, a dispensationalist position, and I'd come at it from a classic dispensationalist position. Um, as opposed to a progressive dispensationalist position, but um, I and I think that's important to consider because one of the one of the main um, issues that that we would have between a premillennial dispensationalist and a full preterist is the idea of the difference between the nation of Israel and the church. We believe that there's major distinctions that need to be taken into account, and the full preterist does not take those into account. And they utterly make mincemeat of the scriptures and their interpretations of them by blending or superseding the nation of Israel with the church. So now the church has taken the blessings of the nation of Israel, which were, uh, which were, um, they were un, unconditional promises, starting with Abraham, uh, between Abraham and God himself, back in the book of Genesis. Now, the second point that he brought up was in Genesis 3.15, where he says the seed pointed, uh, the seed planted is death as spiritual. Now, this is huge. This is massive. This is, this is what we, we call the, the first evangelistic gospel, the proto-evangelium um, in the book of Genesis. Genesis 3.15, it's the promise of the coming of Christ. And it, it's, it's massive because of the implications of it. Uh, related to the atonement, and we won't have time to get in, in into it today, or specifically into atonement theory. Um, but this has massive implications on how uh, Genesis 3:15 not only affects your soteriology but also your eschatology. Um, and and the reason why I say that is because is because Stacy takes the position that Genesis 3:15 is a, is a spiritual promise, while I take the position that what happened in the garden was was a promise of physical death. And as it relates back to the atonement, the atonement of Christ is something that paid for uh, the penalty of death, physical death. So when we're talking about the second death, we're talking about the, 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 the hell being cast into the lake of fire. Um, at, not at the end of the millennium, but at the, en at the end of uh, the war between Gog and Magog, which a lot of people would place in place um, at the period of time which precedes the millennium 
after which the devil and his angels are for a short season. So you've got a period of time after the millennium, which completely gets rid of the problem of having, uh, of, of having death and sin and sickness and all these things during the millennium. Um, and afterwards, because they haven't been completely destroyed yet. They haven't been tossed into the lake of fire yet. And we'll get into that, I'm sure, in our cross-examination time. But you, you can tell and see already how Genesis 3.15 plays a huge part in the, in, in the interpretive method that Stacy would have versus what I would have as, as following the rest of the Bible. You've got right at Genesis 3.15 an establishment through Stacy's interpretive method that the rest of the Bible is going to be interpreted spiritually as opposed to literally, phys physically, and visibly, which is obviously going to play massive issues when it comes to um, the resurrection. And you've got some warnings, even from Paul, that says if you don't hold to a physical resurrection, that that is a heretical view that has overthrown the faith of some. So it's, it is a massive issue for Paul, and it should be a massive issue for us as well because of the implications of how you interpret the Bible, whether it's spiritual or physical. And he says that he, the, the constellation judgment signs, I don't disagree with that, Isaiah 13, 10, I think there's, there's, there's um, judgment signs that, that are talked about in uh, Joel chapter 2, and we'll get into that, I'm sure, as we go along a little, little further, but... He says that Second Peter talks about the Roman destruction of the known world and a new world being created. And this is something that I, I think is, is going to have implications that I'll be able to draw out more as we get into the cross-examination time as well. Uh, but he talks about the idea uh, relating from Second Peter to Psalm 104 and how the earth will sit on its axis forever and ever and says that it's a contradiction because we say that it would be recreated. And I know that I'm out of time, but let me sum it up this way. The idea is actually that when we talk about the renovation of the earth and, and the heavens, the new heavens and the, the, the earth by fire, it's not something that's completely destroyed and, and recreated ex nihilo. It's a renovation. So it wouldn't actually be contradictory in, in how you're looking at Second Peter and Psalm 104. But uh, let's see, we've got 10 minutes of cross-examination. So this would be, uh, this would be, I think it would be me going first, since you did your opening statement first. Is that how you want to do it, or do you want to go first? Yeah, go ahead. Do what you want to do. We're good. Okay, cool. Um, so we got 10 minutes of cross-examination. Let me get to my questions, if I can find them. All right. Whoop. Where'd my, all my questions go? Okay. I'll reset the clock here. Okay, so my first question is going to be relating to the dating of the book of Revelation. I obviously think that's the weakest argument for a full preterist perspective is, is that you would hold that the, the dating of the book of Revelation um, is prior, sometime around 65 AD, 68 AD, um, but prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70. So I, I haven't heard in either your opening statement or your rebuttal um, why you actually think that it would have been written in 70 AD. So if you could, and just, I mean, I'll even give you two minutes. I, I just need to know what your argument is so I can actually address that because that's obviously the weakest link for the preterist, it, not to mention the internal side. But what, why do you think it was written early? Well, I gave you every time indicator. I mean, clearly, Jesus, um, his return is associated with the destruction of the temple when he hadn't returned yet, according to 22. So it not to mention the sixth king was living that was Nero clearly um, the seventh king was going to reign a short time he reigned from three to six months um, it's always this. these are Roman kings clearly it's all talking about ten hills I mean it's all everything in Revelation is Rome and Jerusalem um, as God uses both of them in this judgment that's coming um, the temple's still there. They would have mentioned the temple being destroyed. I mean, that that um, that just is unbelievable to think that a Jew would not have mentioned that somewhere. But he's told to measure the temple. It's still there. Everything is about this temple being destroyed for people to be resurrected spiritually, like I showed you in Hebrews 9 eight. Yeah, so that's... Um, but, but, and coming quickly... John's going through the tribulation. John's still alive. You got to go back. Remember to what I said in Matthew. It all ties in. This is John's version of Matthew uh, 24, all of Matthew. 
Matthew 16, uh, some of them will still be alive. Um, verse uh, 10, they will not have gone through all the cities of Israel. Uh, it all points to before the destruction. Every Everything in Scripture, every time. The late date, no internal evidence. Absolutely none. Okay, um, so you had mentioned that the resurrection is spiritual. And uh, obviously you mentioned some uh, an argument for the, the six kings. Uh, you mentioned uh, kind of an argument from silence that there's no mention of, of the temple being destroyed in the book of Revelation. And then you mentioned that uh, John is, is told to go and measure the temple. So it seems like those are kind of the three internal, the main three internal arguments. But my question is related to your statement that the resurrection is spiritual. What do you, what do you actually believe as, as it's related to the resurrection of Jesus Christ? Was he resurrected physically and bodily as it's related to the resurrection? Yes. If you go to Acts 10, 40, I'll read the verse. Jesus was definitely resurrected physically. He showed his, um, you know, he showed his scars. He, he told them this is a physical body. But it was to prove that all this is real. Um, just like the apostles, they healed the yeah. sick, raised the dead. All of it was to show that the new covenant yeah. was real. It was a real thing. But it was only for signs. Um, the spiritual, the resurrection is spiritual. You, you threw out Paul talking about in 1 Corinthians 15 uh, being physical. Absolutely not. Go to... Uh, Fifteen forty-two through 49 he describes it perfectly well, we'll our resurrection is a spiritual body he goes through it perfectly he says it's not physical okay so you're saying our our body is is going to be spiritual christ's body was physical but in first john chapter 3 it says that in our resurrection as it's related to first corinthians 15 that we don't know exactly what we will be but we do know that the bodies that we will have will be like the bodies of jesus christ so you're saying our resurrection is not going to be physical but well, jesus what? was and our and we're going to be like him so how do you reconcile first john 3 with first corinthians 15. well jesus uh paul made a statement we don't know how he is now jesus is definitely reigning spiritual as a spiritual being in heaven there's nothing physical in heaven there's no body sitting there, arms. Le you're going to have a phys You're going to have a spiritual body, whatever that is. We don't know. Well, um, I thought but, you said Jesus but, resurrected physically and bodily. He did resurrect, but uh, but there was a change to go to heaven. If you notice, uh, when Jesus was here forty days, by the end of his uh, that he was here, they couldn't even recognize him. Um, other than his actions that was he was doing. Um, so I don't know. Nobody knows exactly what those that entails, but but you're taking a hard stance that it's that you do know because you're saying it's not physical. In heaven, in heaven, it's not in heaven. It's not physical. It's spiritual bodies. Okay, the scripture's so, clear on that. So you don't believe that Jesus is in heaven physically and bodily, sitting on a literal throne in heaven right now. Not, no, not physical. Okay, so he's sitting there spiritually, not physically. Yeah, whatever that's whatever spiritually. Means, I mean, we have no idea. The Bible's about um, God's kingdom here on earth, but our goal is heaven. Our goal is to be with Him in that spiritual body. Okay. Paul says it's better. It's better to be in that spiritual body. Yeah. So it's definitely going to be better. I mean, think of God. God's in heaven. Is is our physical world better than God? God's a spiritual uh, is spirit. So, I mean, we, we always want to deduce the spirit. I mean, it's definitely better than the physical. Yeah. I've already shown you of the new kingdom, the new heaven and new earth. I've already shown you there's death in it. So this whole thing about, oh, this, we're going to have this perfect fleshly body, unfortunately, it doesn't fit scripture. Okay, so let's look at, um, you're, saying, you're saying Jesus is not, he was raised physically and bodily. But uh, when he went to heaven, something happened and changed that he's no longer physical or bodily manifested in heaven. It's somehow spiritual, and he's not on a literal, physical, visible throne. It's all spiritual. And there's nothing physical and visible and literal in heaven. It's all spiritual. And um, so by necessity, 
as the resurrection of Christ relates back to us and the promise of our resurrection and the redemption of our bodies in in Romans chapter 8 and Ephesians chapter 1, you would see the redemption of our bodies as being what? Um, a, a new body, a spiritual body. Okay, so we'll have... A, yeah, go ahead. So so we'll have... Um, we will have a spiritual body. When does, when does that happen in your eschatology? Immediately at death. If you go to Hebrews 9.8, it tells you they couldn't go to heaven until the temple's gone. That's why they heard that they had to be... Res, corporate resurrection to judge everybody that lived during the Old Testament. Yeah. Once the New Testament is ushered in without the old, once you die, you immediately go to heaven. You have a spiritual resurrection in this new spiritual body as Paul talked about. Think about this. Um, why is why don't you see people not dying now? Well, There's nothing holding it back. If your view is true, why do we die now? Um, uh, and I'll be really, really happy to answer that question when it's your time for the cross-examination, but I want to okay. ask you that as it's related to death and hell, because obviously, in a full preterist view, you don't believe that there's the devil. The, the devil is already cast into the lake of fire, that, that, right. that hell's been cast into the lake of fire, that death has been cast into the lake of fire, that, that sickness and, and sorrow and tears and all of these 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 things are gone. They're done. They're already in the lake of fire. They're they're in the past now. That we are in the new heavens and the new earth, and Jesus is reigning right now on earth, and we are yes. a part of that kingdom. In your yes. perspective, so um, that would be my question: Is where where is the devil at right now? Where is death right now? Why do people still die? The devil. Wait, but the devil well, just let me fin- let me finish real quick. We've got the, where's the devil, where's death, where's sickness, where's, where's all the sorrow, where's all the tears, where's all the pain that everybody f- feels that we were promised to have gone away with. The hope that we were, were told to look forward to in Titus 2.13 is, is now it seemingly kind of a hopeless situation because you're saying that all that stuff is gone, but so many people in the world today, even Christians, would say, man, that's not the world we're living in. So, it, yeah, take the rest of the time and... And give an answer to that if you could. All right. Um, once again, you got to look at Hebraic mindset. Go look at um, when it talks about no more tears and um, the lion and the lamb, the wolf and the lamb. All that stuff is, um, it's not talking about literal and physical, getting rid of it physically forever. You go to the Old Testament, it's just terms about having that covenant with God. Um, it's not talking about the physical. As far as the devil, like I told you, go back to Genesis 3. His seed was that spiritual death. The Once we have um, the spiritual life and the resurrected life, the ability to be resurrected and go to heaven with Christ in the new spiritual body, the spiritual, the, the, the devil has been defeated. Um, He's thrown in the lake of fire at the end of the Old Covenant age. Um, if you go to Romans 16, 20, it says that, um, I think, yeah, as Paul telling the Romans, you will crush Satan's head shortly. Um, that's what it's talking about. Satan is associated with that Old Covenant. Once death is destroyed, which means we can be resurrected, it does not mean physical death completely. Like I showed you in the new heaven and new earth of Isaiah 65, 66, there's always death. Um, it's talking about being able to be raised spiritually, having that spiritual body resurrection. Um, and like I said, um, there's nothing holding us back from being eternal now if the flesh was yeah. what was the goal. I see. There's, no, there's nothing holding that back. Okay, um, so we're up on that time for the my my round. You've got ten minutes for yours, and then we'll go back to me. Okay. Um. Here's um one thing that's not discussed is it says um, the Son of Man's coming will be like the days of Moses and the days of Lot. 
Noah? You mean Noah? The days of uh, Noah, yeah, and the days of Lot. Um, if you read those stories, it clearly says the ones taken are the lost, not the saved. The ones left are the saved. And if you look at Lot, it says once he left the city, God rained fire and brimstone. That's a perfect picture of what happened to Jerusalem and the temple. Once the church um, saw the armies surrounding Jerusalem, they fled to the mountains, just like Jesus promised. He said, don't go in the house. Stay on the housetop. Because back then, you could run the housetop all the way past to the gate and jump the gate. You can't have that today. Our houses aren't connected. That's what he was talking about. It's definitely a first century fulfillment. So he's talking about um, in their day to escape when you see this army surround Jerusalem. Um, and think about it. If he's telling them that they can run to the mountains and escape, why would he say that if planet Earth is going to be destroyed? That would be pointless. Okay, so... Um, talk about Jerusalem. Wait a minute. So what are we doing? I thought you said 10 minutes. Right, and it, it would be cross-examination for 10 minutes. Oh, okay. So what you want me to do? Well, typically, and the, we ran into this last time too. So on cross-examination, this is where you ask me questions, and that'll give me a chance to respond. Oh, okay. So. All right, all right. That's my question. Okay. Why did he say run to the mountains if the yeah. planet's going to be destroyed? Okay, so for one, you've got the presumption that uh, we're saying the planet's going to be des destroyed at the end of the age in the tribulation period. Let me, let me address the first part of your, your question, which would be the typological argument. You pointed to Noah, you pointed to Lot, and uh, I'll, I'll try to be as brief as I can on this, but prior to Noah, you've got, you've got the gospel that's even presented in the names of the Old Testament saints leading up to the destruction during Noah's time. And what's, what's particularly kind of something that draws your attention is the name Methuselah, which means um, uh, at his death, destruction comes. And, and you've got a contemporary of Methuselah was also Enoch and, and, and Noah. But what's, what's, what's particularly important to, to notice in this typological argument that you're asking me about is the destruction. You're saying, well, the evil ones were taken. But what, what you see is Enoch being a type of the church who is translated out prior to the destruction, Methuselah dying and destruction coming, Methuselah would be a picture of the Old Covenant, Enoch a picture uh, of, of, of the Christians being caught out prior to the destruction, and, and Noah being a picture of the nation of Israel being preserved through the tribulation period. So either way you look at it, you've got a futuristic perspective even in the, typo, uh, the typological argument here. And, and so Noah is a picture, as, as it says in Genesis 6, at, um, as the, the wickedness of men was increased and the thoughts of men was only evil continually. And Jesus makes a reference to that, which also is also a reference to Genesis 6, 4 with, with what's going on with the Nephilim and, and those the idea of why the world was was destroyed and and Noah and his family was preserved, but but even beyond that, you mentioned Lot. Well, Lot is a picture of of a, a carnal Christian coming out through the preservation of of God um, out of a land that was destroyed, Sodom and Gomorrah. A picture of the world that we're in today, as far as morality is concerned. And, and I don't think it takes much to, to look at what was going on in Sodom and Gomorrah for us to see the likeness of what Jesus was relating to going on in Sodom and Gomorrah to what's going on today. So even with Lot and Noah, you've still got a futuristic perspective even in those typologies. But you said, why is he telling them to flee to the hills and flee to the mountains and the rocks if the world is going to be destroyed? But what, what you're missing is, who is he telling that to? He's telling that to the Jewish people. And he's telling the Jewish people, he even says, woe to you who are um, with child, because you're going to be fleeing for your life, and if you're going to be doing it during the tribulation period, it's going to be really tough for you to get around and, and flee to these rocks. And that's why you've got the typology that you mentioned with Moses. He is the cleft of the rock. He's the safety for the Jewish people through the tribulation period, um, preserving them through the greatest time of trouble the world has ever known. So when we talk about the second coming of Christ, the second coming of Christ comes at the end of the Great Tribulation period 
which um, leads us into Matthew 25 and the judgment of nations. But it's the preservation of the nation of Israel and the recognition of Jesus as the Messiah and their Lord and Savior uh, that leads to that. So that's why he says, except that these days be shortened, um, there should be no life uh, who lives to the end of these days. So um, that's that would have a lot to do with that. It's not the destruction of the world as, as you would think, but that'd be my take on it. Well, the problem is those passages that Jesus is talking about, he's not even mentioning Methuselah or Enoch. It's not about that. It's about the people that are sinning and the one who escaped. Um, not to mention, um, like I said, um, they flee the city. He tells them to flee the city. They go to the mountains. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I didn't see that in that question. But what about physical death? Um, if Jesus paid for it and we're going to have new bodies, why wouldn't it happen already? What are we waiting on? Uh, we're waiting on the fullness of times. Um, you've got you've got two aspects. One would be one would be um, the one would be the second coming of Christ, the timing of the second coming, and one would be the fullness of the Gentiles. So I believe it's Jesus who says that um, the fullness, of, when the fullness of Gentiles has come, that's when he's going to come back. So he's he's waiting essentially for this. And obviously, I'm a dispensationalist, so I I have a I have a distinction between the nation of Israel and the church. So when I speak of the fullness of the Gentiles, the the time of the Gentiles started in 606 BC with the final captivity of the nation of Israel, or 586. BC, depending on when you date the ten northern tribes in Judah and the two southern tribes, but but specifically what you're looking at is the time of the Gentiles um, bringing the salvation to the last person who's going to get saved in the church age before um, God's attention is turned 100% back to the nation of Israel for the for the 70th week of Daniel's uh, vision in Daniel uh, chapter seven, eight, and nine. But um, that would be that would be dealing with the nation of Israel. So that that would be the reason why it's still, it's it hasn't happened yet. Um, the time of the Gentiles in Isaiah, in uh, Luke twenty one still hits before the Son of Man coming on the clouds. So show me. I showed y'all the verses of Christ's return. They're all talking about first century. Show me a passage where Jesus is going to return in the future. Yeah, so you've got Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14 is a prophecy about Jehovah God who is going to return on the Mount of Olives. And uh, specifically, that's a reference to Jesus Christ, who is Jehovah God, who left at the Mount of Olives. And when he left in Acts chapter 1, he said, uh, why do you men gaze, uh, why do you men fear gazing at, at, up at the Son of Man and in heaven, for as the Son of Man is left, so he's going to return in like manner. So he left on a cloud. He's going to return on a cloud at the Mount of Olives. That is Jehovah God, Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, who is going to return on the Mount of Olives. That's the first point of his return. And then he's got, I've got the whole uh, kind of line of where he's going to go from that point up until he draws the line in the sand um, in the Valley of Gehenna, or the Valley of Shinnom in Matthew 25 at the Judgment of Nations, where you've got the, the judgment of, the, of goats and, and sheep. Okay. Um, but I don't have it right in front of me, so I don't know. So, Revelations, um, I showed you where Jesus said, let the sinner stay a sinner. How's that 2,000 years later if he said, let the sinner stay a sinner? Open the book now. The time is now. Uh, where, are you, is, where are you talking two, about? Revelations 22, 10 through 12. Um, all right. Let me look at that real quick. I'm trying to pull it up here. All right. So it says, And he saith unto me, Seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. And he which is filthy, let him be filthy still. And he that is righteous, let him be righteous still. And he that is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me 
to give every man according as his work shall be. Um, so, and obviously he makes a reference back here in verse 13. I'm Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Another reference to uh, Jehovah God as being Jesus Christ and a reference to himself. But specifically as it's related here, um, you've got in, in the book of Ezekiel and the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation, these three are interlinked to this particular passage because what we believe is, is at the end of uh, the millennial reign of Christ, which is a, a literal, visible, physical reign of Christ, where he returns to earth bodily and physically and visibly at the end of the tribulation period and separates the nations and then establishes his, his throne, which he mentioned in Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, that will be um, forever and ever. If the increase of his government, there shall be no end. That's the throne where Jesus leaves the throne in heaven, the throne of God, and comes down and sits on the throne of David in the temple, the third temple, and establishes the millennial reign for a thousand years. At the end of that millennium, you've obviously you've got physical people still living here on earth um, that have chosen to chosen Christ essentially and and to live under his reign physically. Now, what's interesting about that is the Bible teaches that the devil and his angels are going to be loosed for a short season at the end of the millennium. So what this is probably a reference to is the devil and his angels being loosed again at the end of the millennium uh, to give those people in the millennium a choice uh, with some sort of um, influence that's going to be a, a, the, the lack of restraint of the Holy Spirit and the reign of Christ where that's where what it leads into the reward that is with Christ that leads to the great white throne judgment. So the great white throne judgment would proceed after the events that happen here, which we would say is uh, Ezekiel 37 and 38 with the battle of Gog and Magog, which is a reference to the end of the millennium. But anyways, all right, so I've got 10 minutes for my final um, cross-examination time. Let me get back to my questions here. Now, um, as it's related to the timing of the writing of the book of Revelation, you, you typically, you've got the external and the internal witnesses. You focused on the internal alone, and you gave three main arguments for them, being the six kings, as probably what you would say is your greatest argument for the numbering of the six kings. Now, could you, for the sake of argument for um, our audience, Give the number for each king that you are saying leads up to the number of Nero, and how do you know what their numbers are? Um, I'll have to pull that up. Because that's kind of a huge point for your for your argument. Well, and while you're doing that, I would just um, encourage the audience, if you guys are listening and watching, go check out Mark, Mark Hitchcock's doctoral thesis on the subject on the dating of the book of Revelation at pre-mill.org. And um, he actually addresses this. And I can give a little bit of the answer after after um, Stacy gives his answer. If he doesn't, if it, we'll see where he goes with this. But, um, but there's a lot of discrepancy on the numbers of these kings leading up to the sixth king and depending on how you number them and who these numbers would be a reference to would greatly impact the argument for the preterist in saying that Nero would be the sixth king so yeah and the name Nero meant six 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 hundred and sixty six well that's what I'm asking you is how do you come to that interpretation because there's a numbering system that's used and um, um, that's kind of the whole point of your argument there. And I'm not sure if how you would deal with that. His name doesn't mean 666. It's a numbering system that's used to, right. to arrive that's at that, that number. Exactly. And if you don't know, that's fine. We can move on. It's not a big deal. 
The reason you know it's Nero is six, besides you know the years, you already know the years, he reigned from 54 to 68, is because the seventh reigned a short time, which fits what Scripture says. Yeah, and that's kind of the whole... That's kind of the whole point of me bringing that question up is it, it kind of presupposes that Nero is the sixth king. So um, that's my that's my point is I want to challenge how you get to that um, conclusion. That's what I'm challenging. Because um, I disagree with that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I knew him, but I hadn't looked at it in so long. It's not, I mean, like I said, I've already shown you about 30 other time indicators. It's not. Hey, and your, your camera pointed us up to the ceiling, by the way. Yeah, I'm having to use my laptop to type. My, hold on a second. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so um, I, I think I've, I've got an answer on that. Maybe you can come back to that in our, our time to, uh, to just have open dialogue, but but it, it, as far as the internal evidence goes, you used the argument of the six kings, but you also used the argument of the destruction of the temple. And you're saying, well, if the temple was destroyed, it's it's more of an argument from silence. They would have they would have written about that. The Jewish people would have written about it. You cannot fathom the Jewish people not writing about um, the the temple being destroyed and then and then being rebuilt. So um, my my question is. If you see Ezekiel writing about a temple and going out and measuring the temple, and the temple there was no temple in existence when he was told to go out and measure it, why do you think that the same couldn't be said of John to go out and measure a temple when a temple wasn't in existence during his writing? Wait a minute, now what did you say? It, in reference to the temple, you're saying... You're saying that the temple couldn't have been destroyed, but John was told to go out and measure it. So my question is, Ezekiel was told to go out and measure a temple, and uh, there was no temple for him to actually go out and measure because there's no temple. But he's told to go out and measure it, and he writes, he writes it, uh, all the measurements of the temple, and John does the same. So why, why do you think it's unfathomable that John would be told to go out and measure a temple when, one, he was exiled to the Isle of Patmos, so he couldn't have physically gone there, but two, it's it would. Why is it well, inconsistent for John, but not inconsistent for Ezekiel? Well, because the whole importance is that the temple is going to be destroyed. That's why John is saying to measure it. I mean, all this the revelation is all leading up to getting rid of that temple, as um, Matthew twenty four, Luke twenty one, uh, Mark thirteen. Everything's about getting rid of the old covenant, getting rid of the temple. Um, you know, Peter said, First Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand. He's talking about getting rid of the old covenant. James says, um, you know, it is all at hand. John, in First John two eighteen says, we are in the last hour. It was all about getting rid of this old covenant system, and the only way to do it was to destroy Jerusalem and the temple. And they, that, they knew that was their salvation. That's why Jesus said, run outside the city. Um, when you see this army, this is the time when all scripture is fulfilled. Luke seventeen twenty two. Um, so John is just getting that vision. John's going through the tribulation one nine. Um, these are the things that had you have seen and are about to see. Everything is happening right there in John's day, and it's all about destroying the temple. So if yeah. the temple would have been destroyed, if if there was no temple there, the one that they've always talked about. It doesn't fit. It makes no sense if the temple's been gone for 30 or 40 years. It does not fit. Not to mention, and I don't like using external evidence at all, um, but if you look at history, Nero was much more persecuted than Domitius. Um, he was, you know, he acted as God. He sat in the temple. You know, Second Thessalonians says he'll sit in the temple as God. The temple's still there. If he's sitting in the temple... The temple's still there, because once um, the temple's destroyed and a new covenant has kicked in by itself, you can't go out and build a temple because the Holy Spirit is not in it. It doesn't count. 
the Holy Spirit has to be in the temple for it to count as God's temple. So for this to be futuristic makes no sense. Nobody would recognize this. A Jew, they wouldn't recognize this as a temple because it has to have the Holy Spirit in it. And it's, once that temple was destroyed, they lost their power because now the Holy Spirit is in the new covenant, the body of Christ. Okay, so um, obviously there'd be a lot to address in, in what you had referenced there, but I, I think that what, what you're presupposing is, um, is on the internal side of the argument for the temple being there or not being there would be to look at uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3 with the seven churches. So my first question is, do you believe that these seven churches actually existed? Yes, seven little churches in okay. that day. It and was written, the letter is written to the seven churches of Asia. Why is that? Because Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. That whole area is affected by the Roman war. So these churches are going to take the gospel to the rest of the world. Yeah, okay, and I've got one minute left. Um, so I want to spend some time on this because this is this is kind of a key to the whole preterist argument is these, you said that it was one letter written to these seven churches. I would argue that they w there were seven epistles written to seven churches. So it'd be seven letters, one to each church. Um, but specifically, uh, as it's related to the existence of these churches, um, these 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 churches, as to when they started, is going to be kind of the key to the preterist position and using this as an argument for um, a past event. Because my question is, how can you have the Church of Smyrna, um, the Church of Smyrna, uh, being written to prior to 70 A.D. when they didn't exist at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem? Um, okay, what verse is that? That's that. It's two seven, I think. But the Church of Smyrna historically didn't come into existence until after the destruction of Jerusalem. So how could how could John be writing to that church when they didn't even exist well, at the time? Well, there again, you're talking external evidence, which, like I said, you never can go by some man's writings. Um, you can't trust. You can't go by anything that some man wrote um, 200 years after. It's you, you can't compare that to scripture. You have to go by what scripture says. I mean, you're talking about the Greeks and Romans. They're going through the apostate, the apostate church. They're, it's all um, under subject. It doesn't hold up the scripture. Trying, well, trying, to, trying to say the seven churches weren't literal does not hold up the scripture. He's going through their sins, telling them how they're living, telling them, telling Philadelphia, you know, hold on, you know. Your judgment is only for this little while. I mean, it's it makes no sense to categorize, take these uh, churches and try to make them be, you know, dispensations of time. That's not a, a scriptural um, foundation. Yeah, I didn't make that argument, but um, okay. But so that's what that's what they believe. You know, that's that's what they teach to um, try to refute that. Is what I'm saying. Well, I would disagree with that, and I'm a dispensationalist. But um, okay, let's. Uh, how about it? You've got ten minutes for your cross examination time. So whenever you're ready. Okay. Um, let's see. For all, so all the time indicators clearly says these things will be upon you. The time is at hand. I'm coming quickly. Everything points, you know, John, you know, is there in the tribulation. Where do you get your time indicators outside, not outside of Scripture? Give me internal time indicators yeah. that can change the definition of what there is being said here. Like uh, Romans 16.20, does Satan's head will be crushed shortly. All those terms meant, you know, that it was about to happen. Okay, so let me let me do it this way. Um, you've got in the book of Revelation, you've got you've got a lot of claims for what I would say obviously would be a futuristic prophet prophetic application. That would be in chapter one three, twenty two seven, twenty two ten, 
22, 18 through 19, and then, and then chapter 10, verse 11. But in the Old Testament, you've got 1,800 plus references to Christ's rule on earth, and 17 Old Testament books are given prominence to that event. In the New Testament, there's 216 chapters and 318 references to the second coming. It's mentioned in 23 of the 27 books, but specifically as it's related to the book of Revelation, he says, uh, he says that he's writing um, to the things past, to the things that are present, and to the things that are pu- future, where he says this, the things which were, which are, and things to come. So you've got the past, the present, and the future. And we'll see in the same tenses as being used in our salvation. You've got, you've got Christ loved us, he washed us, and he made us kings. Those are all past. But you've got the, the three present tenses as have, have, have been saved, we're being saved, and we will be saved. But specifically, um, as we're referencing the, the historical side of that argument, the past, the present, and the future, the past are the things that he was writing about in chapter 1. The present would be those, those seven churches that he was writing about uh, being present and active at, in 95 AD when it was written, and the future is everything that follows chapter 3. Well, chapter 1 is not the past. He's saying these things are shortly about to take place. You're going to see the Son of Man coming on the clouds, those that pierced him. Chapter 1 is definitely hadn't taken place yet. Um, but anyway, uh, let's see. Um, so Jesus talks about Luke 21. He says, you know, the end of all, he says, when you see the army surround Jerusalem, know that all prophecies fulfilled. How do you get around that? Uh, how do I get around what, specifically? Well, he's telling them they're going to see the abomination of desolation, that they're going to be, you know, Jerusalem is about to be destroyed. He's telling them when you see the army surround Jerusalem, know that the end of all things is at hand, all prophecies fulfilled. How do you get around that verse and make it a distant future? Yeah, um, well, for one, I, I think that you've got to be able to draw distinction and see the differences between what Luke 21 says and what Matthew 24 says. And if, if you really look closely at Luke 21, a lot of people are going to tell you, and especially the preterist perspective, and even post-trib guys are going to say this, that uh, Luke 21 and Matthew 24 are all referencing the same events. But if you look at the phrase that Luke uses, he, he says in verses 25 through 35, specifically seem to focus on the 70 AD prediction. But Jesus separates that from the Great Tribulation period as not being something that's part of the end times, but specifically something that would precede the end times, where he says this, but before all these things. And when you see in Matthew 24, he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. And then he says, then shall they. So you've got in Matthew 24 a reference to then shall they. Luke 21 is before all these things. So Luke 21 is going to be a reference to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, but it's the preceding events that lead to the Great Tribulation. They're separate from what Matthew 24 is referencing because Matthew 24 is referencing the Tribulation period. So you've got difference between tribulations, tribulation, and you've got the great tribulation. Uh, the great tri- everybody's going to have trials in their lives. We're all going to have tribulations. We're we're going to have tribulation and and issues in our lives, and challenging times and, and all of that. But there's a huge difference between that and the great tribulation. What happens in the great tribulation is something that the world has has never seen and we'll never see the likes of the events that happen ever again. Uh, specifically when in some of the events that, that take place in Revelation chapter 9 uh, through 11. Um, but that's essentially what you've got is what it comes down to um, in the arguments of Luke 21 and 24. Luke is going to reference the destruction of 70 AD. Matthew 24 is going to be the prophetic event of the future events in, in the Great Tribulation. But if you look in Luke 21, 36 through 38, you've got A key point that I think we should point out at some point in this conversation is um, the idea of this generation, where he says this uh, this generation shall not uh, pass before they see. um, Let me see what it is. 
I can't remember the exact words, but he says is a, it's, it's a reference essentially to the generation who sees the actual signs of the end of the age. So the question is, how can they escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man? Well, apparently, Luke's Olivet Discourse didn't occur on the Mount of Olives, and those would summarize the teachings in the temporal temple over several days. So the teachings in Luke would cover several days, and in contrast to Matthew 24 specifically, these are not the signs they're looking for in response to the question they asked. They asked for the signs of the end of the days, the sign of the end of the time, the sign of the coming of Christ. And the sign, he, he specifically tells them, these are not the signs, but these will precede the end of the days. So he's telling you, like, these are not the signs to look at. Like, it's kind of the opposite of what the preterist says. We say they're not the signs. The preterist says they are the signs. And so that that's kind of how I would... Um, give an answer to that, the difference between Luke 21 and Matthew 24. Well, Matthew 24, Jesus' return half is in verse 29 and 30. 34 says, in this generation. This generation clearly is that generation. So he tells them his return is immediately after the apostles see the abomination of desolation in verse 15. Not to mention chapter 23, he's looking at the Pharisees and he's telling them all the judgment of all the blood of the prophets is on your generation. It's there, it's there's no wiggle room for a future this generation, especially when Luke tells you this generation is yeah. that same generation going through that same judgment. It uses no, the same chronology. See, and same with Mark thirteen. That's where I would disagree because it, obviously that'd be kind of the point of the argument. You're saying, well, it's a reference to this generation, the people that's standing in front of him that he's speaking to. And a lot of the Reformed camp is going to give the same the same argument. you got guys like Jeff Durbin and James White. They use that argument for their side of their eschatology, but they're wrong. And, and I think they're wrong because he's answering the question of, of uh, the second coming of Christ. When's he going to come back? When, is, when are all these events going to happen? The end of the age. And he, he tells them, yeah. he tells them this generation... He's, he, the reference that he's making with that generation is going to be the generation that actually sees these things take place. And it, it's not the people that's standing in front of him. And that leads into some bigger problems that I'm going to bring up in our open dialogue um, on your side of, of interpreting Luke 21 and Matthew 24. But, um, yeah, where do you want to go from there? Go ahead and continue. Um, yeah, well, here's the thing. It all goes back to when the Son of Man is returning. It doesn't matter what you try to say about this generation, you bring up Durban and everybody, the coming of the Son of Man clearly is in that generation during the Apostles' time. Like I showed you, some will still be alive. They will not have preached to all of Israel. They will see the abomination of desolation, and then they'll go through the trials, and then immediately the Son of Man comes on the clouds. The same with Revelation 1. They will see, those that pierced him will see him. That's impossible 2,000 years later. So um, it all falls on the fact that I, I know they like to pick and choose little verses to try to get out of it. Everything is tied to that same event. That's why Luke 21 22 is devastating. It says, All prophecies fulfilled when you yeah. see the army surround Jerusalem. All prophecies. See, the problem with that is you, you're saying that you don't, you won't go to. A, uh, an external argument, but you're presupposing an external argument that, that Nero was the abomination of desolation. But what's, what's interesting about that presumption, which is what it is, is that the abomination of desolation as being written in church history was actually something that preceded Nero. And it was with Antiochus who actually, who, who actually um, had the pig sacrifice on the altar in the temple which was what historically people called the abomination of desolation, which was not ever referenced to what happened here as being a reference to um, a prophetic event that was fulfilled when that happened. So even, even in your external evidence for Nero being the abomination of desolation, it still doesn't support what actually happened in church history. But Okay, so we've got 15 minutes of open dialogue. Let me get the clock up there for that, and then we're going to cut to closing statements. And for those of you who are watching, um, we've got 15 minutes of open dialogue. We'll see uh, how that goes to transition to 
our closing statements, and then we're going to open it up to you to call in if you would like to. That number is 816-866-0025. And again, uh, we are doing a debate between a full preterist and a premillennial um, on an, the eschaton. So with that said, it's just going to be 15 minutes open conversation. And if you could, I'd like to kind of um, bring up the first point to you, and then you can you can go see where you want to go from here. But uh, in 2 Timothy 2, verses 17 and 18, it says, And their word will eat as doth a canker, a cancer, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus. And their word will eat as doth a cancer. Oh, wait, I just said that. Um my question is, oh, he says in verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Now, how would you how would you respond to what Paul is writing about here in 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18 as it's related to the resurrection and those, those guys that are being specifically named here as overthrowing the faith of some by saying the resurrection is already past when he's obviously expecting it to be future? Right, because it was future. <laughs> the resurrection is tied to the, the destruction of the temple. So these guys are teaching lies before it happens. The same thing as Second Thessalonians 2. Some have told them that Christ you know, had already returned, and they were associating his return with judgment on, on Jerusalem. Well, if you go to Second Thessalonians 2, it says they thought it already happened future tense um, if the world's going to blow up or burn up or there's going to be a rapture of people disappearing that's not in it that statement's impossible you're not going to convince people that Christ has returned if you know if it was some kind of physical observable thing uh, Jesus was clear uh, the kingdom of God will come without observation they won't see it in Luke 17, 22, it says, you'll long for the day to see a son of man, and you won't see it. Jesus is not going to be a son of man on planet Earth again. There's not going to be a little man coming down on a cloud, sitting with the people. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about the coming of the Spirit of God amongst us, which is the new covenant. Um, that's why the Spirit can be everywhere. It's not talking about a little man coming down. And that's why you know Second Thessalonians 2, 2 um, the same with these two guys, they were trying to say that it already happened. Because remember, the apostles knew that it was a sign of his coming. They were looking for a sign because they knew he wasn't coming back physically. If he's coming back physically, you don't need a sign. You know he's going to show up. You know people are going to disappear. You know, uh, you know it's going to be obvious. Well, none of that's scriptural. It's going to be without observation. There's not going to be a son of man ever again to be with people. It could, Luke, Jesus, Jesus said that in, John, in Luke 17, 22. Um, it's, just, it's all spiritual, spiritual kingdom. Um, and like I said, in Second Thessalonians, you know, he's sitting in the, he's sitting in the temple. The temple hasn't been destroyed yet. Um, all these things in Thessalonians is talking about the things that are going to happen to them he says that in their body they'll get relief um, if they're going to see you know what first Thessalonians 4 if Jesus is going to return and resurrect them in a rapture then the second Thessalonians makes absolutely no sense because they you know it was, they were getting fooled by people saying that it already happened well there's no way nobody's going to be fooled if people are going to be disappeared and the planet's going to burn up this is clearly talking about there was judgment on Jerusalem going on, and they were saying, oh, this must be the sign of his coming. Well, no, they know it's associated with the destruction okay. of the temple, according to Daniel. Okay, um, I think we kind of got away a little bit from um, what I was trying to get at there, but one of, I've got a couple more questions, then I'll give it over to you and see what you would, you would like to address. But one thing that I see as a huge problem with preterism is you say that the resurrection took place spiritually in 70 AD when Christ came back spiritually in 70 AD. Um, but the problem is you've got people that are beheaded prior to the resurrection and you're saying that the resurrection is spiritual. This is this resurrection is the promise of the spiritual new body in 1 Corinthians 15. 
So if you've got people that are beheaded prior to the resurrection of 70 AD, and if that resurrection is spiritual and not physical, it seems to me that you've got people getting saved after they're already dead. So how do you kind of square that circle there? Well, you are you're talking about people who died um, during the transition of 70, 30 AD to 70 AD when the Old Covenant and the New Covenant was still here. Because if you go to Daniel, if you notice, Daniel's about ushering in the New Covenant. But what is included in Daniel's um, prophecy is the destruction of the city by the people of the prince, which is the Roman Empire destroying Jerusalem and the city. So that is included in that New Covenant. And the reason is because they got to you have to purify God's covenant. You have to get rid of that old covenant. But he honored it until the temple is gone. That's why there's no resurrection until the temple's destroyed, according to Hebrews 9.8. Um, it's, it's a promise until then. That's why it says you're sealed until the day of redemption. Um, it's a promise salvation until you're actually saved. Until you go to heaven in a spiritual body, it's a promise. If if I promise you ten dollars, if I never give you ten dollars, then you never got the ten dollars. It's a salvation is a promise until it occurs when you are actually resurrected and you are with God in heaven, which for us is going to happen immediately at death. But for them, they were waiting on. It. It's called the already but not yet. They were waiting on that um, resurrection. So were those ones beheaded. It said, how long, Lord, you know, in Revelation. So they're waiting on that resurrection when they receive their body, which happened on the last day. Remember, Jesus told uh, the disciples, I'll resurrect you on the last day. He's talking about last day of the old covenant because the new covenant, there is no last day. It's forever. Okay, so let's look at, let's look at um, two more aspects here. You've got... You've got the idea that death and hell have already been cast into the lake of fire. So my first question would be this, and then I'm going to uh, go back to Titus 2.13 and then turn it to you. Now, you believe that death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. They don't exist anymore. Um, they're, they're destroyed. Now, what does, that, what does that say about the salvation of everyone who is alive from today to the end of forever uh, who dies? Because obviously we've got, you're going to have death, you're going to have... Uh, sickness, you've got all these things that are cast into the lake of fire that don't exist anymore, sorrow, tears. Uh, it seems like they still exist. It seems like, you know, people are still dying and are still sick and have sorrow and pain and trouble. Uh, but you're saying it's all in the lake of fire right now. What happens to the, what, what is the, the true experience that we're having when we think we're experiencing death and sorrow and sickness and pain? And where, do, where does everybody go when they die if, if all of that's already been cast into the lake of fire? Well, like I said, you're resurrected spiritually in a spiritual body, according to uh, Paul, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, it's not about the physical. The physical is not what God focused on. It was about that spiritual death that Adam died in and... Um, was uh, passed down to us. We're all spiritually dead, and we needed that. Re we need that resurrected body. We need that resurrected spirit, which occurred once the old covenant was done away with. We now have access to heaven, and it happens once we die. We have immediately access, um, and that's what they were waiting on. That was what um, the physical is just all. It's always going to be there. That's not what God is talking about, the physical. Otherwise, like I said, Jesus has paid for sins. You should be already, uh, you should live forever now. There's no reason to hold anything back if Jesus is sitting on the throne and he's resurrected. Your spiritual, your physical body should have already changed over. You should go ahead and live forever if that was going to be the promise because of what Christ did. That wasn't the yeah. point. Christ was about the spiritual resurrection of, of us. Yeah, so that's my point. Um, what happens to everybody? It, it seems like it, ha it would have to logically be a universalist position since death and hell are cast into the lake of fire already. 
they don't exist. The devil, he's already there. His angels, they're already there. Everybody who rejected Christ up to what you're saying is the beginning of the new covenant in AD 70, they're already there. So what happens to everybody now? Like we're in the new heavens, the new earth right now when we die. Right. Everyone who dies, you're saying they go where? Who doesn't accept Christ? Um, you just die physically. Spiritually? Um, well, you already did spiritually. The only... Immortality only comes With. from a gift of salvation, a spiritual gift, a spiritual resurrection. A person that's lost never will never receive a spiritual resurrection. Um, there's no law. The law has been passed away. Um, so, you know, the judgment, you know, Jesus died for the world. He died for all sin. The, but what resurrects you is belief in Jesus dying for your sins. It has to be faith um, in Christ to receive that resurrection. So people that die without Christ, um, they don't have a resurrection. There's nothing. Like if you study scripture, um, you know, John 3.16 says, um, perish. Um, if you look all through the Old Testament, it's a perishing. When you die, you just die. You're gone. You're you dissolve. You remember yeah. no more. Um, you have the Im immortality comes as a gift, and it's only to those who believe in Christ. Yeah. Okay. In the, under the new covenant. So what? Um, in in Titus, and I'll address some of that in my closing statement. Not not to bring up new material, but just to re respond. And, and then I'll turn it back to you if we need a little more time. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might uh, redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of, of good works. What do you think is the blessed hope? And is that something that we're still looking forward to? No, they were looking for the blessed hope of Christ's return. That's exactly when did he return? He tells you. He returns in their generation. Okay. To get to get rid of the old covenant and usher in this new covenant, where when you die, you immediately go to Him. That's what's ushered in the new heaven and new earth. Um, go to Isaiah sixty five sixty six. It's it's talking about this time period. You know, there's salvation, there's the increase of His government, but there's still physical death. You can't get around that in Scripture. Um, and that's why I'm a full prayer. I have to accept what how God set everything up, how He ordained it, how His plan is clearly a spiritual resurrection to be like the angels, to be in heaven with Him. Um, yes, this is new heaven and new earth. The kingdom is here, but it's here through the Holy Spirit. Um, he's reigning there and here. He's reigning. He, he's, you know, He's rules over heaven and earth now he cast satan out you go to Re uh, revelations 12 satan only reigns satan only um you know wreaked havoc for a short time it says a short while because he was destroyed um like uh, paul said to the romans shortly he was destroyed at the end of the old covenant i see uh, which I would disagree with. So, um, how about you? Do you have anything that you want to bring up to me? We've got a couple minutes left. No, I, I will say that when I first started studying this, I think it was like 2002, and, um, you know, I, I grew up Baptist, so, um, you know, they got all excited about the last day's um, madness and, you know, all the movies, left behind movies. Well, I got this looking at that, and immediately I became all millennial because of what Jesus said about the last day is when he's going to resurrect everybody. I, I skipped over, um, you know, the dispensationalist teaching right off the bat. Um, I guess my question is, how are you still dispensational? That verse, um, you know, I can see if you ignore... And, or you just don't know how scripture you haven't studied long enough I can see how you might be post millennial but how can somebody be pre millennial when Jesus tells the disciples I'm going to resurrect you on the last day yeah I, I'm not 
I'm not sure um, why that would be a problem to be a dispensationalist. I mean, how, well, well, because, where's the conflict? Um, dispensationalist thinks that there's a rapture and there's people left on earth to live out days, seven years of tribulation. What Jesus says, I'm going to resurrect you on the last day. How, how do they, uh, you know, how do you ignore yeah. that comment about being the last day? Yeah, because we draw a distinction between the rapture of the church and the resurrection of the body. So that's that's. I mean, I think it it seems like you're you're saying that if the you're foundation, wouldn't the foundation of the church be raptured? Wouldn't uh, Peter and Paul, Peter, Paul, you know, John, James, wouldn't they be raptured? Because he's talking to them, saying they will be resurrected on the last day. Are they not raptured? Well, no. What we're talking about is, um, yeah, you've got it. You'd have to draw out the distinctions between the resurrection and the rapture. Um, the rapture is, is going to be two parts. Um, specifically, it's, it's related to the second coming of Christ, but the second coming of Christ would be referenced in two phases. The first phase is, when, is with Christ returning in the air, uh, not all the way to the ground of the Mount of Olives. And when Christ returns in the air, he calls up the church, which you see at the beginning of Revelation chapter 4, John being a type of the church, called up hither, he says, come up hither. John, being a type of the church, um, is called up. And then from Revelation 4 all the way to Revelation 19, there's no mention of the church. You don't see any mention of the church in the tribulation period at all. Um, but then you see the resurrection, uh, at, you see a resurrection at the end, which is the second resurrection. So you've got two resurrections in the Bible. One resurrection would be at the rapture of the church. The second resurrection would be at the great white throne judgment. So that would be that. All right, so we let's go to closing statements. You've got 7 minutes to go for yours and then I'll cut to my closing statement. Well, uh, my closing statements pretty much, you know, you have to use a lot of external evidence and just looking at false teachings to go against um, the new covenant eschatology which is what the preterists believe which is just that this the new covenant is spiritual it's here it's within us you know it concludes with a resurrected spiritual body in heaven everything points to that the return of christ i didn't hear anything that, that went against what i said all the verses in scripture are clear his return is in his generation to those that would still be alive that pierced them um, nothing about anything in distant future ending the planet because the new covenant, like I showed you, is eternal. From generation to generation, offsprings, they will have babies. His government will increase. Um, salvation will come through generations forever. As long as the sun and moon is in the sky will be the, the length of the new covenant, um, which again knocks off any thoughts of the planet being burned up um, and rolled like a scroll and remade. Um, everything points, every single thing, every statement, every prophecy, everything points to that generation. Um, all prophecy will be fulfilled um, when they see Jerusalem um, encompassed by the army. Daniel's prophecy ushering in the covenant is a 490 year prophecy. It's not a 2,490 year prophecy. It's 490 years in the middle of the week. The sacrifice ceased. This is all talking about first generation. This is not talking about in the times um, because scripture does not talk about an end of times. It talks about an end of the age, which is the old covenant. All the disciples pointed to this end of the age. This was at hand. The last hour is about to take place. Um, they were all looking forward to the new covenant where they can reign with God um, as his people uh, without all these persecutions from the old covenant church um, and getting rid of that um, covenant. Um, and it all pointed to that first generation Um Revelations, the timing, clearly. He, he tells them, open up the book, the time is now. 
Well, it was closed for about 800 years from Daniel to then. To say the time is now and then go another 2,000 years and it still hadn't happened goes clearly against the hermeneutics of that uh, comment. Then he says in the next verse, he says, let the sinner stay a sinner. I mean, nobody can ever get has ever gotten saved if that verse is distant future because he's clearly talking to John. John's alive in the first century. You know, it's clearly saying it's going to happen like he says in that next verse, I'm coming quickly. That's the, um, when he comes and judges, raises everybody like Daniel 12 says, that died under the old covenant. That's when he raises Daniel at the end of that age. Um, everything points to ushering in that new covenant, which, yes, yeah, started at the cross, but God counts um up until getting rid of the temple as the fulfillment of that event. He wants to cleanse his covenant. He gives Israel 40 more years to repent. That's why the um, apostles had the signs, the miracles, the healings um, to prove as Joel 2 talks about and as uh, 1 Corinthians talks about. It's a sign to them. Um, God's giving them a chance to repent. And they don't. And so they're judged when their city and temples destroyed and burned. Um, that's what scripture is about. Um, Adam died that day spiritually. Um, it's not talking about physical. 900 years later is not that day. Um, everything's about spiritual. Paul's clear. We get a spiritual resurrection, a spiritual body. God is spiritual. We worship him in spirit. We don't understand what that means. We don't. God didn't give us the ability to, to get to that point and gives us all the details on heaven. Um, that's why it requires faith. Blessed are those that see without, you know, that believe without seeing. That's what the new covenant is all about. It's about a people of faith, you know, all down since um, Seth, um, even down to Abel. I mean, it's all about faith, believing and now we are under the new covenant, believing without seeing. That's the new covenant. But we, we will be rewarded with spiritual resurrection. That's it. Awesome. Okay. Let me cut this back to me. I probably won't take the full seven minutes, but for those of you who are tuning in live still, you're going to have a chance to ask your questions. If you want to, you can call in at 816-866-0025. Um, I'll try to answer it as it comes in. Uh, so let me just and see what I can do as, as those calls come in. But um, you'll have a chance to address that to either myself or to Stacy. But essentially, guys, what I see in the in to close here is the, the same two arguments that I presented, the internal and the external, still stand. Uh, the external wasn't even attempted uh, to be addressed by Stacy. Stacy's just said, like, hey, you can't trust man. Like, we're not even going there. Uh, and that's his argument against the external evidence. I mean, um, Hegespis... Uh, in the in the very early first century, immediately after 95 A.D., is making references to the destruction of Jerusalem as not being the events that were foretold in the Book of Revelation, and the events in the Book of Revelation is still being yet future. Irenaeus uh, saying that the events that specifically took place with Nero uh, were not the events mentioned in the Book of Revelation. Um, Tertullian. Uh, all of these, all of these different references that I made to show uh, on the external side of church history, what was said about the events immediately following the destruction of Jerusalem, and yet somehow, um, fifteen hundred years later, preterism is invented, and now in 1960 it makes its way into Protestant Christianity, and it's adopted now uh, in what people are calling liberal and heretical sex saying that preterism is something that's already in the past. So it's problematic if you if you actually look at church history. And obviously if you're a preterist, you do not want to have an argument for the external side of the book of Revelation as being written prior or post 70 AD because uh, if you if you use an external argument, you have no credibility for making an argument that uh, preterism is true because the external witness works against you and and that's probably why we didn't hear that tonight 
But on the internal side of the argument, we, we heard three main arguments, the first of which, when I questioned Stacy on the six kings and the numbering system used for those six kings, is absolutely one of the most incredible things that you'll ever look into, is how, to, how they actually, the Preterist comes up with the numbering system for Nero to say that his number is 666. And you know, my old cost accounting teacher in college used to tell me if numbers are tortured enough, they'll confess to anything. And I think that applies to the method that is used by the preterist when it comes to the numbering system to give Nero the number 666. They have tortured those numbers enough to come up with a numerology um, dating system that uh, has created their own code system that goes to not the Greek, but the Hebrew letters for Nero to come up with the numbering system that makes his number 666. And not only that, but uh, to say that he's the sixth king has been absolutely, utterly annihilated in Mark Hitchcock's uh, dissertation on the dating of the book of Revelation. Um, specifically because of, one, the dating system, but two, the numbering of the kings. There is a massive discrepancy in the numbering of these six kings to say that Nero would be the fulfillment of the events in the book of Revelation. So not only do you have a massive problem with the actual dating to be an early date, which wasn't addressed at all by Stacy, uh, but two, you've got an immense uh, discredibility when it comes to the numbering system used to come up with 666 for Nero, along with uh, the idea that he is the sixth king mentioned. So, uh, but then you've got his, the, his second best argument that he used, which would be uh, the actual temple. He says, well, the temple couldn't have been destroyed because of the abomination of desolation. But notice when I brought up the idea of Antiochus as being referenced historically as the person who was called the abomination of desolation for the act that he did with sacrificing a pig on the altar in the temple as being that desolation, that act of desolation, the desecration. Um, the desecrating act, and not Nero. So that's obviously another historical fact that w you've got to ignore if you're, a, if you're a preterist. But when we go to the actual temple being measured, I showed the similarity of the vision between John and the vision of Ezekiel. They both were told to go and measure a temple that was not in existence at the time. And they were told to do it in a, in a vision. And that's exactly what they did. They, and they wrote it down and, and they recorded it. But specifically as it's related to Matthew 24 and Luke 21, um, the argument still stands. Luke 21 is a reference, no doubt, to the events that took place in AD 70, but with the caveat that Luke 21 says that these, these things were to come to pass before the events of the Great Tribulation. So the things that happened in AD 70 were written and inspired by God to be said uh, that they are not the events that are written about and what takes place in the book of Revelation as the end times. Uh, and, and not only that, but Matthew 24 makes it abundantly clear that they're, they're different discourses. One is, one is a discourse that takes place over many days, Luke 21, and Matthew 24 is an event that took place on one single day. There's a lot of similarities between the two things, but specifically, um, there's, there's massive differences as to the timing of the events that are referenced and they need to have a little bit more time spent there. So now as it comes back to the book of Revelation, another argument that should just seal the deal as it comes to the timing of the writing. And I'll, end, I'll sum it up with this, guys. The Church of Smyrna had not come into existence uh, at the time of, prior to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Church of Smyrna was witnessed to by Irenaeus, who was a disciple of Polycarp, who was a disciple of John. And, and Polycarp says that the Church of Smyrna didn't come into ex existence until somewhere between 85 and 90 AD. So it was about 20 years after the destruction of Jerusalem um, that, that the Church of Smyrna actually came into existence, which if you take that at face value, it utter utterly annihilates the idea that John was writing this prior to the existence of Smyrna as something that was written about as having uh, been present at the time of the writing. So guys, I'll end it with this in Titus 2.13 when Stacy said that we don't have the same blessed hope of the return of Christ as they did when Paul wrote those words. 
I, I, I completely reject that and disagree. Because the blessed hope that we have as Christians is something that we look forward to as something that is yet future. The return of Jesus Christ in the flesh, in the bodily form of a man who is God in the flesh, just the same as he was when he came in his first coming. He's going to come back again and set up his throne on the throne of David on this earth. And he's going to return on the Mount of Olives, which is the same place that he left in Acts chapter 1. So guys, I'll sum it up that way. I hope that's a good a good place to end. And we'll turn it over to you uh, for questions. Uh, if you have any questions, go ahead and call in. 816-866-0025. Whoever would like to call in first will have the first question presented uh, to those of you who are listening. If not, that's totally fine. We can cut it here and go on. Um, but I, I don't see any questions that are coming in online. I see that we've still got about 25 people that are viewing live. So if you have a question, you can type it into whatever chat platform that you're watching from um, or call in. So I'll give it a few a few more seconds here and try to see if I can find a question online. But let's see here. I'm trying to look at this. I know it's kind of difficult there. All right, we've got one call coming in. Let me take my headphones out. Gary Whitehouse. Gary Whitehouse. Yeah, Gary Whitehouse. Yeah, Gary Whitehouse. Hey, Gary. You are going to be our first caller, and uh, you're live right now, so whenever you are ready, you can go ahead and just tell us who your question is to. And uh, we'll just go from there. Okay. So whenever you're ready, what's your question? Oh, I'm going to um, ask Stacy. This is a question for Stacy. Okay. Stacy, and I got a couple, a few questions. One of the he asked about the free trip or what? But are you there? Yeah. Okay, so you said that he asked a question about the pre-trip. You kind of cut out there. Um, what was the rest yeah, of it? Yeah, um, this is for Stacy, and I'd like to have you answer. I got about two or three questions. One of them is that um, in Mass, I mean, First Thessalonians four sixteen, where the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Yeah. Uh, that's a pre-tribulation rapture that he would be. We would be caught up in the air. Okay, so Stacy, do you want to address that? It seems like very. Let's go with the first question, then we'll give you a chance for that second one, Gary, um, and give right. Stacy a chance to reply. It seems like Stacy Gary is making the argument that First Thessalonians four is a reference to a pre-tribulation rapture. Um, so, how would you respond to that? Well, there again, First uh, Thessalonians four, you know, is in within those two letters. Um, like I said. Um, they were going to get relief in their bodies, according to, um, I think it's uh, 2 Thessalonians. Uh, let, me, let, me, let me get to that first. Anyway, the, as far as the 1 Thessalonians 4, that word for called up, the English language doesn't have a word for that. Um, it's a picture of going out to the, in, to the outside of the city meeting the king and bringing him back into the city. That's what that word means. We don't have a word for that because we don't do that. Um, which makes perfect sense. Christ coming, we bringing him back into the city. That's the Holy Spirit is with us now. Um, it's not talking about disappearing. Like I said, if that was true, Second Thessalonians 2, where they were fooled by people saying that it had already happened, Clearly, it had not happened yet, um, it, it, which is what Paul was saying. Um, don't don't be deceived; it has not happened yet. But they were but they were getting told it had already happened, because they were looking at judgment on Jerusalem. They weren't looking for a man to part the skies. That was not. That's why they were looking for a sign of his coming. It was not going to be literal. They were looking for the sign was the judgment on Jerusalem and the temple. It was not where people disappear from earth. That's just a completely made up. Over yeah, so, time, as we got as we got further away from scripture, we kept making up stuff, and that's what we did to that verse now because we don't have a word for that for that called up word. 
Yeah, so what I would say in response to that, Gary and Stacy, is uh, one, I'll address the word that's that's in Greek for caught up, it's harpazo. And in the Latin, they, they came up with the word raptura and transliterated into the English would be rapture. So we use that transliteration from the Latin to describe the harpazo, which is the catching away of the bride of Christ. And uh, specifically, the word rapture is, is kind of a descriptive word to be enticed with the love, enticed with love, caught up in. And it's, it's, it's a reference to emotion um, in raptura from the Latin, but it, in reference to 1 Thessalonians 4 and the har- harpazo, it's, it's not just a reference to an emotion, it's a reference to being caught up with someone physically. And, and when we're talking about that being brought back to 1 Thessalonians 4, it says that the Lord is going to descend from heaven with a shout. Notice the same wording is used in John 17, where Jesus says that he came from heaven to earth. And I got one uh, more. he's going to come again with the trump okay. of God. So a lot of times people will look at, at this and cross-reference it back to 1 first, first Corinthians 15 and say, well, if this, is, if this is the last trump and the trump is being blown here, then that's got to be at least a post-tribulation rapture of the church being caught up or raptured or whatever you want to call it. But the difference here, and take notice, guys, for those of you who are, are still with us here, is that we've got a trump of God here which is, is a voice of God. The trump is, is a voice to some people hearing words, and it's, it's just a sound like a trumpet to others who don't understand or discern what the, the, the sounds are actually uh, making. So the, in 1 Corinthians 15, that would be the trump of God. The last trump in Revelation 7 um, would be, in, in 11, would be a reference to the actual sound that a trumpet makes as coming from an angel. So that would be that. Well, um, and I'll turn it back to you, Stacy, and then get to let, your second question. Well, Aaron. let me make a comment on that. I didn't, I should have said this. Um, it says that with the voice of the archangel, which if you look at Jude, that's Michael. Um, and so what it's talking about is Daniel 12, when Michael stands up and he, and he, um, you know, resurrects the, the dead and judges them. That is when um, Michael stands up, is the archangel. He comes with the sound of the archangel. That's uh, Michael, um, as First Jude says. Um, so it's just a reference back to Daniel, which there again happens when they lose the power, the power of the holy people shattered, which is the temple being destroyed. That's when they lose their uh, power. So that is clearly a reference back to happening in that generation to them who lived in the time of the temple. All right, so what's your second question, Gary, and we'll keep this train moving. My second question is, and I'll get off because uh, I want other people to call in. Stacy mentioned about the um, spiritual resurrection, I mean, returning, or a spiritual one like Jehovah Witness, and I'll say that too. And here's one in, uh, in Acts 1 at, um, 11, which also said, uh, Ye men of Galilee, what? Why are you standing uh, gazing in heaven? This same Jesus, which was taken up from you into heaven, shall come in like manner as you see him going in heaven. Right there is his physical return. When, when he physically went back to heaven, he phys- he's going to physically return. So how can you spiritually return? Well, my answer to that is what does like manner mean? We don't know what that means. Does that mean on a cloud? Um, does that mean as the Spirit of God? Because remember, Jesus was the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit came and was born. So what happened at Pentecost? The Holy Spirit came down. Um, we have no idea what actually that means. Just to all of a sudden say, oh, that's a person. When clearly I showed all through these two hours, this the, re- the return of Christ happened in his century. He he said it did. He said they were still alive. Oh, we have to we have to accept what Scripture says. There's no verse in some distant future outside the destruction of the temple. It's all in his generation. Um, so to take that Acts 1, 11 and just make up some entirely, which is what the church has done, um, just goes against what Scripture clearly teaches. Um, and, and like Jesus said, it would not come in observation. It won't be as a son of man. He said, you'll look for, you'll long for the day of the son of man and you won't get it. 
He's not going to be a man. It says the sign of his coming. Um, they're not looking for a physical return. Everything contradicts the mindset of that uh, that verse being him coming back as a person. Okay, so we might have time for one more call if somebody would like to call in, and I'm going to give a response to that and just say, um, if, if you want to call in, this will be the last question that we answer unless somebody does call in. But my response to that is, it, it's going to sound... Um, I don't want it to come across rude, but I, I do want it to come across blunt and, uh, and and clear. What I'm saying is, is what I believe is you've you've added one level of heresy onto another level of heresy, and the first level of heresy is the idea that you said that Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit, um, who came into the man Jesus Christ, and then you said that He's going to come back as a spirit, as spirit. And that's, that's the second coming of Christ that we see. And that w there's no way that we can actually have for sure an understanding of what that verse means because of our understanding on Jesus Christ as a spirit. So the idea is, I, I would say you can't as a oneness person because you don't actually understand who the Bible teaches Jesus Christ actually is as the second person of the triune Godhead. Um, but obviously you wouldn't be able to interpret, take that, from a oneness perspective and understand what he's saying in Acts chapter one, because uh, of your interpretation of who Jesus Christ is in the first place. So with that said, we've got one more call that's coming in here. This will Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I, I got to answer. I got to answer that. Second, um, second Corinthians three seventeen. Jesus is the spirit. That's what it says. Okay, perfect. So we've got we've got our next caller. This is going to be our last question for the evening, and then we'll cut her loose from there. But if you could state your name and who your question is to, and we'll go from there. Yeah, my, my question is to uh, yourself, I guess. You're, you're Joshua, correct? Yes, okay. All right. I'm, I'm sorry I missed most of the debate, but I, no I do worries. have a question. A long because, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the question is in around John 14, uh, 18. Okay. And I can read it or you can pull it up. I, let me pull it up here. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come. Preach it. <laughs> Preach it. Go ahead. I'm sorry? Um, um, yeah, what's your question there? Okay. So how I am, I actually would, uh, my view is, I am, I'm a full preterist, but my question is, why couldn't Jesus, um, if God can rule and reign from heaven, and God is a spirit being, why couldn't Jesus do the same? If you read John 14, 18, and other scriptures, but starting with John 14, you will see me. So I want to ask you, when do you think that was fulfilled? Yeah. Because how I look at it in the context, in the, in the context of the coming of the Holy Spirit, so he was with them, and he will be in them. We all know that Galatians talks about the Son and the Spirit of the Son is in us. And we have the Spirit of Christ. So yeah, Jesus, amen. In a metaphysical term. Amen. Doesn't that also correlate with First Corinthians who talks about Jesus is now a life-giving Spirit, we have, and we no longer know him according to the flesh. So why couldn't Jesus rule and reign from heaven in a spiritual uh, bodily form rather than the physical and how would you see John 10, yeah. 15, 18? Um, okay so let me let's look at this um, and and I'll go ahead and hang up I, I'm sure you'll be able to hear online but we'll we'll follow up with that okay, sure. so. thank you I'll pull you up online again. awesome thank you thank you for the question by the way so this is something that we actually spoke about in our debate on the Trinity versus oneness doctrines and in reference to John 14, 18, it's, it's, it's a massive topic between these two views, and it's obviously having an impact on our view of the, the eschaton. So when we talk about the paraclete, um, the oneness person is going to talk about one paraclete. There's only one advocate. There's one comforter, uh, and that's going to be the Holy, the Holy Spirit, who is the Father, who was in Jesus Christ, who is now in us as the Holy Spirit, as this comforter that he's referencing in John 14, 18. And the difference between the 
oneness perspective on John 14, 18 and, and the Trinitarian perspective on John 14, 18 is the obvious reference to two separate individuals. One individual is being Christ, I, that's a singular pronoun, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. And he goes on and, and talks about sending the comforter who is another comforter in John 14. And, and it, it might, where is that? It might be in, yeah, but the comforter, verse 26. These things have I spoken unto you, being yet present with you, that's Jesus Christ. But the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. You have three singular pronouns in verse 26. The Comforter, who is the Holy Ghost. The Father, who will send the Holy Ghost in my name. That name is Jesus Christ, who is the person uh, who died on the cross uh, and rose again from the dead on the third day bodily and physically and who's going to return in like manner. So the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, is going to be the one who replaces Jesus Christ when he leaves. Jesus Christ is the comforter in John 18 and 14, 18. And he says in a little while, the world's not going to see me anymore, but you'll see me because I live, you shall live also. And then he talks about when he goes back to the Father in heaven, which is the glory that he had with the Father before he was incarnate. That's the same glory that he went to return to and replaced himself with with the Holy Spirit at Pentecost uh, in Acts chapter, I think it's chapter 2. Um, but yeah, that'd be, the, that'd be the comforter. Jesus was the first comforter and the first paraclete. The second paraclete is the Holy Spirit. And these three are distinct. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are distinct. And they're all co-eternal, co-existent, and uh, um, have the same authority and power. So... Anyway, Stacy, I know you and I have huge disagreements on that. Exactly. <laughs> and it, I would take it that this guy is probably um, a oneness person as well, but I don't know. I mean, um, maybe that's something you could clarify in the chat. But anyways, Stacy, I'll give you a chance to respond, and then, guys, this is going to wrap it up for this episode, and we'll go on from there. So go check out that debate that we did, the Trinity debate. So. Yeah, it was good. This one was good, too. I mean, I enjoyed it. Um you know, I mean, you know my view. There's one Lord. He is the Spirit, you know, that's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He was the Spirit in Jesus. Jesus was clear, you know, it was the Father that was in him. But anyway, preterism, it leads to that because Jesus hands the kingdom to the Father. He does it um, when his earthly reign is over. And we are in the spiritual kingdom, this spiritual kingdom. But, you know, we, we already did all these uh, rebuttals and all. All I'll say is we're in the new heaven and new earth, the new covenant, according to Scripture. I see. All right. Awesome, man. Hey, thanks again for coming on, Stacy. This is going to wrap it up for today's episode. And you're welcome back anytime. Maybe we can come up with something to debate in the future. I do believe that you've added good. a level of heresy onto the first level of heresy. Um, but you know what? Your Pharisees just means uh, the majority. That word doesn't mean nothing. Well, it means a lot to um, the Orthodox. So yeah. Um, okay, and and I think that you know when you get the a debate on the eschaton isn't something that's going to determine your eternal destiny. Uh, this is a good conversation to have, but I do believe that it imp impacts your view of your eternal destiny, and that's important. Uh, but I'd say something that is important as it's related to your salvation is going to be that debate that we had um, a few weeks ago on the Trinity debate. So go check that out, guys. Once again, thanks again, Stacy, for coming on. And uh, I'll catch up with you soon, and we'll we'll go from there. But, guys, I'm going to cut to my closing scene here and uh, see if I can uh, kind of give you an update on what to expect in the upcoming weeks. But... Let's see here. We've got on the 28th, Kevin Thompson is going to come on and talk about Calvinism. And uh, then on July, the second week of July, July 12th, Matthew Broderick, our Catholic apologist friend, is going to come on and do a debate on purgatory, which uh, if you haven't seen our last debate on uh, ooh, the Eucharist, he and I did a debate on the Eucharist last week, I believe. Um, so go check that out. That was a good debate as well. 
he's a really nice guy. He's a good, good Catholic, uh, but he obviously believes that um, your salvation is dependent on meritorious grace plus your works um, that will merit more grace in order to give you more works to have final justification and end up in a place called purgatory where you will atone for your own sins until uh, somebody either, either prays you out of purgatory or you've, you've, you've paid the penalty enough to the point that God's satisfied and allows you into heaven. So anyways, next week, Kevin Thompson, that's going to be a good one. Stay tuned for that. Subscribe, hit the notification bell, and be notified when we go live so you don't have to miss us. As always, guys, God bless. Share this stuff, like it, rate us, and uh, it's on audio podcasts as well, so you can find us on all the major audio podcasts, podcasting platforms as well. So with that said, God bless you all. Have a good evening, good night, and we will 